Hello, I'm Muriel Bowser, Mayor of Washington, D.C. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the D.C. Bar's 2020 conference and to join you in commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. We know that the ratification of the 19th Amendment was a monumental achievement, one that required organizing, determination, and perseverance by a broad coalition of voting rights activists. But it was also an incomplete victory. Many Black, Indigenous, Asian, and Latina women were still not able to vote, and in many cases wouldn't be able to for decades. Even today, we must keep fighting in order to fulfill the promise of the 19th Amendment that includes right here in the nation's capital, where all 706,000 Washingtonians, including more than 350,000 women and girls, are still denied voting representation in Congress. I hope we can count on your help as we work to fix this lasting injustice by making Washington, D.C. the 51st state. Thank you again for being part of this event and for all your work supporting the legal needs of district residents. Enjoy the conference. It is inaccurate to say women were given the right to vote. Women had to fight for that right. But the history of the 19th Amendment paints a picture as vibrant and powerful as the heroic women who championed the cause. A cause taking lifetimes. Women's status in the New World is of varying degrees of unfree, with enslaved women of color the least free. Regardless of race, age, marital status, or birth, women are defined by their dependency to men. The colonies adopt the English system, decreeing that women cannot own property or keep their own earnings. A few years later, all states passed laws denying women the right to vote. Some were bold enough to speak out against it. If we mean to have heroes, statesmen, and philosophers, we should have learned women. And we did. American abolitionist Sarah Grimke writes Letters on Equality of the Sexes and the Condition of Women, denouncing the injustice of lower pay, denial of equal education, and sexual objectification. I know nothing of man's rights or woman's rights. Human rights are all that I recognize. Sarah Grimke would become known as the mother of the suffrage movement, inspiring a revolution. Ten years later, the first women's rights convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes the Declaration of Sentiments, a plea to end discrimination. It is signed by 68 women and 32 men. At a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio, Sojourner Truth, a former slave, delivers her historic speech, Ain't I a Woman? If women want any rights more than they got, why don't they just take them and not be talking about it? But just as the momentum was building, civil war. Women are encouraged to put their energies towards the war efforts. The war may have been over, but our fight for the vote was just beginning. Susan B. Anthony casts her vote in the presidential election to test whether the new 15th Amendment granting voting rights to African-American men could be interpreted to include women's suffrage. She is arrested. Men, their rights and nothing more. Women, their rights and nothing less. The first women's suffrage amendment is introduced in Congress. It is defeated. 10,000 suffragists march down Pennsylvania Avenue, the first civil rights march on Washington. I always feel the movement is sort of a mosaic. Each of us puts in one little stone, and then you get a great mosaic at the end. Alice Paul and over a thousand other silent sentinels picket the White House. They endure jeers, physical attacks, and even arrest, but nothing would stop the rising tide. President Woodrow Wilson states his support for the women's suffrage. A year later, the Senate passes the 19th Amendment. And on August 26, 1920, three quarters of the states approve ratification. American women can no longer be denied the right to vote. But the fight for suffrage didn't end there. Crystal Eastman's famous speech, Now We Can Begin, speaks to the work that still needs to be done in the areas of gender equality and civil liberties. In 1920, she co-founded the ACLU. Years pass. Suffrage becomes a reality for many, but not all. Various discriminatory practices are used to prevent women of color, particularly African-American women living in the South, from exercising their rights. 
More than 500 peaceful protesters are attacked by law enforcement officers while attempting to march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama to demand voting rights for African Americans. Their voices would not be silenced. That same year, the Voting Rights Act is signed into law. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. The purpose of women's rights is to raise up all of humanity. And over a hundred years later, the struggle continues. But thanks to the brave heroes who've come before us, the foundation for freedom has been laid. In the memorable words of Crystal Eastman, now we can begin. Welcome to the DC Bar 2020 Conference, celebrating 100 years of the 19th Amendment. Hello, and welcome to our virtual DC Bar 2020 conference, 100 Years of the 19th Amendment. I'm Shelley Broderick, your host, and I could not be more pleased to welcome you to this important and historic event. First, I want to thank Mayor Bowser for that powerful statement and welcome. As the mayor on our opening video have demonstrated, women's suffrage was not won in a single day. We're here to commemorate the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which after a century of struggle, constitutionally guaranteed women the right to vote. But this conference also recognizes that this right did not extend to all women right away. It would take decades more before minority women could access the ballot. And for others, the struggle for full enfranchisement continues to this day. As many of you know, this event originally was scheduled for last spring in person. But then, life as we know it changed for all of us. Like many of you, we pivoted. The result is this multi-day virtual conference filled with engaging content. We're glad you're able to join us safely. The legal community has a special role to play in the struggle for progress and change. The right to vote is a pillar of our democracy, and it deserves our focus and attention now more than ever. This timely virtual event will bring together historians, judges, authors, journalists, and leading practitioners to explore the history of the 19th Amendment, to honor the sacrifices and persistence of the courageous women behind the suffrage movement, and to elucidate the critical issues facing our nation today. Over the next two days, you will hear from Pulitzer Prize-winning historian and biographer Doris Kearns Goodwin, who will sit down with DC Bar immediate past president, Susie Hoffman, to discuss the role of leadership in the suffrage movement and its lessons for today. We will explore voting rights issues today and in the future with separate panels on the rights of the incarcerated, those in the military, and veterans. We will tackle women's issues, including disparate treatment in education, as well as other systemic and institutional challenges to full equality. And while we celebrate this historic milestone in our country's history, you can take advantage of opportunities to earn CLE credits. Before we begin, we would like to thank our sponsors whose invaluable support has enabled us to bring this virtual, informative, and educational program to you. I would also like to thank our speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise on these important topics as well as our DC Bar conference planning staff and committee staff who've worked tirelessly to plan this conference. Finally, we thank you at home for tuning in and spending the next two days with us. Without further ado, welcome to the virtual DC Bar 2020 conference commemorating 100 years of the 19th Amendment. As famed suffragist and lawyer Crystal Eastman said after passage of the 19th Amendment was finally secured, now we can begin. Our first speaker is Lisa Hellum, Executive Editor for Strategic Initiatives at Bloomberg Industry Group. At Bloomberg, Ms. Hellum develops editorial strategies focused on emerging audiences in the legal profession and works to expand brand engagement. Today, she will moderate our panel on the history of the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage. Please welcome Lisa Hellum. Good morning. 
I'm Lisa Hellum, Executive Editor for Strategic Initiatives at Bloomberg Industry Group. I'm also a proud member of the DC Bar, and I'm honored to be your moderator for the 2020 DC Bar Conference opening panel on the history of the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage. In 2015, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg gave a key piece of advice to young women students at Harvard University. She said, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Justice Ginsburg, who passed away on September 18th, was a noted advocate for gender equality, who wrote 483 majority opinions, concurrences, and dissents for the high court. And yes, she was also a pop culture icon, admired by many women as the notorious RBG. Today, Justice Ginsburg's words seem acutely apropos as we convene to consider the work of women leaders from generations past, those who led the fight for women's suffrage in the United States, ultimately securing the ratification of the 19th Amendment on August 18, 1920. This morning, we'll discuss these women, their motivations, their alliances, their differences in strategy and approach. And yes, we'll discuss their sisters in the struggle who would not see their hopes to vote fully realized until decades later. This morning, we are fortunate to be joined by an all-star panel. Elaine Weiss is an award-winning journalist and writer whose work has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, and on National Public Radio. She is the author of The Women's Hour, which tells the story of how women won the right to vote as they descended on Tennessee, the last state needed for the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Betsy Griffith is an expert on women's history, and she's the author of In Her Own Right, The Life of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, which inspired the Ken Burns PBS documentary, Not For Ourselves Alone. She recently completed a new book, Marching from Suffrage to Equality, American Women, 1920 to 2020. It's the social and political history of what happened after American women got the vote. And Dorothy Patton is the author of From Suffragists to Senators, A Century of Laws by Women Since 1920. And she's an attorney advisor in the US Department of State. Dorothy is also a proud member of the DC Bar. And in the past, she served as a staff attorney at the FTC and as a deputy press secretary for Senator Barbara Boxer. As we know, the march toward women's equality has been a complex journey, and it's one that continues today. This morning, in the first half of our talk, our speakers will take us back through a brief slice of the journey. And in the second half, we'll all convene for a question and answer session. We begin with Elaine Weiss, who will briefly discuss the road to ratification for the 19th Amendment. And now here's Elaine. Hello, as students of the law, you know that the US Constitution does not guarantee the right to vote to anyone. It only designates classes of citizens who shall not be denied the vote. Our national history is one of the slow and contested expansion of these classes of shall not be denied populations. So this is the story of how American women's demand for the vote, a concept once considered radical, crazy, and subversive, was slowly and methodically transformed into constitutional law. It's the story of the 19th Amendment, the largest extension of the franchise in our nation's history, extending to vo the vote to half of the citizens of the nation who were not included in the Founding Fathers' vision for our government by and for the people. The fight for women's suffrage is one of the defining civil rights struggles in our nation's history, and it's one that cuts to the heart of what democracy means. Who gets to participate in our government? Who has a voice? And of course, we are asking those questions today. The 19th Amendment was not just a legal change. 
it was not just a constitutional change or even an election law change. It didn't just double the national electorate. It didn't just make women full citizens for the first time. It also marked a societal change, a cultural shift about the role and the rights of women. And that's what made it so complicated and so controversial. Now, we often mark the beginning of the women's suffrage movement to the first women's rights meeting in Seneca Falls in 1848. But of course, women were talking and complaining about their unequal position long before that. The term women's rights is actually an oxymoron in mid 19th century America when the movement begins. There were a broad array of rights denied to women. She had no rights to her own property. Um, she did not have custody of her children. She had no rights to, um, no standing to bring civil suit in a court of law. She had no ability to testify in a court of law. And of course, she could not serve in a jury. She didn't have access to higher education. Most professions were closed to her. The franchise, the ability to vote, was just one of the resolutions presented at the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. And when Elizabeth Cady Stanton stood up and demanded uh, that resolution number nine, it was actually considered too radical, even by the participants in the meeting. But there was a young man in the audience who had driven his buggy 50 miles from his home in Rochester to attend the meeting. It was Frederick Douglass, just 30 years old, just 10 years out of slavery. He stood up and he supported Stanton's outrageous demand for the right to vote, saying, you must be willing to demand this. You must be willing to fight just as I must be willing to fight for the right to vote. And it was not a coincidence that Frederick Douglass was there. The women's rights movement actually emerges from the abolition movement. The movements were entwined. The idea of all humans having a divine spark and having uh, being entitled to freedom and agency. And so the four mothers of what we consider the women's suffrage movement were actually abolition organizers before they were suffrage workers. And they had the goal of universal suffrage. Now, they um, believed that after the Civil War, both women and Black men and Black women would be given the vote. And they were sorely disappointed when they were told that the nation could not handle two large reforms at once. And so this alliance was fractured by the 14th and 15th Amendments, which gave rights and the right to vote to Black men, but not to Black women or white women. And as we see often, the powers that be pitted two disenfranchised classes against one another. Um, and racism would continue to vex the movement employed by the suffragists when politically expedient, but even more so by the anti-suffragists who use race as a weapon against women's enfranchisement. Now in the years following that Seneca Falls meeting, tens of thousands of dedicated suffragists waged over 900 state, local, and national campaigns to win the ballot. They traveled hundreds of thousands of miles to do, as Susan Anthony described it, organize, educate, and agitate in tiny towns and big cities across the nation. They had to change hearts and minds about women's role and rights in society before they could ever hope to change the law. They were considered radicals. They were frightening. And they had to endure contempt and ridicule in their communities, their churches, their clubs, and even in their own families. They were pelted with rotten eggs and spoiled vegetables. They were attacked by mobs of angry men and boys. They were denounced as radicals, perverts, traitors, anarchists, bad wives and mothers, of course, even communists. They were derided as unattractive, unsexed, the fear was they were going to abandon their families if they got the vote and emasculate American men. Now, the fight for women's suffrage played out within the structure of our federalist system. States, as you know, are in charge of voting requirements and election administration in their jurisdictions. So the suffragists worked to change the law at both the state 
and federal levels simultaneously. They sought referenda or legislative action in the states to remove obstacles to women voting. And they also pursued a constitutional amendment that would cover the entire nation. And they attempted novel legal approaches on both levels. In the 1870s, they employed a creative interpretation of the 14th Amendment based on the rights and privileges of citizens clause. And they maintained that women already had the right to vote, they just needed to exercise it. To test this in the 1872 presidential election, Susan Anthony, Sojourner Truth, and nearly 200 other women attempted to vote in the election. Susan Anthony was arrested, tried and convicted of illegal voting in a federal election. She brought her case to the public in a series of lectures entitled, Is it a crime for a US citizen to vote? And of course, we're asking that question again today. The slow pace of progress in Congress and in the states. The federal amendment was introduced in 1878. It was stalled there for 40 years. It was voted down in Congress 28 times. And this slow pace uh, stirred frustration and anger within the movement. And a new generation of suffragists, the third, grew impatient, no longer willing to wait or plead politely. They were willing to be confrontational and disruptive. Movements split, as reform movements often do, over strategy and tactics. Alice Paul and her National Women's Party picketed the White House, protested in Lafayette Park, and on the steps of the Capitol, and burned President Woodrow Wilson in effigy. Hundreds of Women's Party suffragists were arrested and served time in prison, and the suffrage prisoners were held in decrepit, vermin-infested cells uh, at Aquacon and in the DC jail. They were physically assaulted, clubbed, tied to the wall. When they refused to eat, they were force fed. Tubes rammed down their noses. Finally, in 1919, after World War I was over, the federal amendment was finally passed by both houses of Congress. And by the, a year later, by the summer of 1920, 35 states were needed, uh, pardon me, 35 states had uh, ratified the amendment, one more was needed, and it turned out that Tennessee was the most likely possible state. There was fierce opposition in Tennessee, uh, as there had been around the, the nation. Powerful forces were working against ratification in Tennessee, political, corporate, and ideological fo foes, each with their own reasons for opposing the amendment. Politicians who feared this unpredictable new voting bloc, 27 million women would be eligible for the vote and no one knew how they were going to vote. Clergymen who believed that women voting went against the will of God and corporations that believed women would be bad for business, including the textile manufacturers who were afraid that women voting might want to abolish child labor. So, but the most, but the most passionate opponents were women women anti-suffragists who organized and fought against their sisters getting the vote. All sides confront one another in Nashville and it gets wild. There's bribes and booze and propaganda and blackmail, conspiracies and kidnappings and fistfights. The newspapers call it suffrage Armageddon. And the outcome remains in doubt until the very last moment and it all comes down to a single vote of conscience from the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature who receives a letter from his mother. Thanks, Elaine. And now we'll have Betsy Griffith discuss what happened in the wake of the 19th ratification, which women were included in the, in the text and which were not. And what did suffragists turn their attention to next? Take it away, Betsy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Picking up from Elaine's suspenseful ending, Harry Byrne voted for suffrage. It passed in Tennessee. The governor signed it and put it on a train to Washington, DC. That train arrived at 3 a.m. on August 26, 1920. Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby rushed to certify the 19th Amendment, signing it at home. He acted before opponents could secure an injunction when the DC Court of Appeals opened at nine. There were no photographers and no cameras. 
The two rival leaders of the suffrage movement celebrated separately on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue. Carrie Chapman Catt, head of the two million member National American Woman Suffrage Association had tea at the White House. Alice Paul, head of the upstart National Women's Party had organized the 1913 parade and the pickets toasted a suffrage flag at Lafayette Square. The language of the amendment was straightforward. It enfranchised an estimated 27 million women. It did not give women the vote. It forbade states from denying voting by women and it did not cover all American women. Native Americans were not considered citizens until 1924 when Congress passed the Snyder Act. These two native women were critical to its passage. But citizenship did not guarantee voting rights. States were in charge. States with large indigenous populations barred them from voting until forced state by state to remove those barriers. The last came down in Utah in 1962, but suppression of native voting persists today. Asian immigrants were considered aliens and eligible for citizenship under the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Our alliance with China during the Second World War prompted repeal, and then other Asians, including Japanese, were eligible for naturalization after 1952. American women married to foreigners were not considered citizens until passage of the Cable Act in 1922. The amendment did not enfranchise women living in the territories. So Hawaii and Alaska had um, given suffrage prior to 1920, Puerto Rico and the Philippines not until 1935. And no resident of the District of Columbia could vote until 1961 when the 23rd Amendment passed. Black women were covered by the 19th Amendment. Suffrage had barely defeated a white only amendment and many segregationists voted for suffrage, believing that white women would outnumber blacks and immigrants. States determined who voted. On the whole, black women voted in the North and the West. Ida B. Wells in Chicago voted and uh, registered 7,000 other people, helped elect a congressman, a black congressman uh, in 1928. Mary McLeod Bethune voted in Florida despite Klan harassment. Charlotta Bass, uh, Los Angeles uh, newspaper publisher who would uh, serve as vice president on the progressive ticket in 1952, voted in California. Of the civil rights icons, only Mary Church Terrell, who lived in the district, did not get voting rights in 1920. Where everywhere, um, black men and women were confronted by sanctioned violence. Lynching spiked. Employers and landlords brought economic pressure. All Blacks confronted blatantly discriminatory poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, and white-only primaries. White women saw discrimination as a race issue. Black women understood, long before scholars named it intersectionality, that race and gender were connected. So the 19th Amendment was an incomplete victory. No effort was made to enforce it. Not until the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 could suffrage be fully celebrated. And we know, of course, that efforts to exclude people from the polls continue today. In its final push, suffrage was a national, multi-generational, multi-racial mobilization, as demonstrated in the New York State suffrage referendum campaigns where women of every race and ethnicity were precinct captains and turned out the vote. When suffrage passes in New York in 1917, it's a big boost to the national passage of a federal amendment. The fight for women's voting rights was brilliantly managed by Carrie Chapman Catt and brilliantly publicized by Alice Paul, two autocratic charismatic women who couldn't stand each other. The 1920 election was a landslide for Republican Warren Harding. Journalists believed that women voted for him because he was handsome, actually had a very strong women's platform. The prospect of women voting nationally provoked excitement and anxiety. Polling places were moved out of saloons and 
Barber shops and into schools and fire stations where drinking, swearing, spitting, and smoking were forbidden. But despite all the hoopla, women did not vote enough to count. The number of eligible voters doubled, but turnout declined to 49% in 1920 and 43% in 1924. After ratification, the suffrage coalition split. Black women pursued anti-lynching and equal protection laws. Civil rights was an underground movement organized by women church deacons, agricultural agents, teachers, nurses, community organizers. They were the backbone of the civil rights movement then and now. Anti-suffrage white women remained active and antagonistic in the DAR, women patriots, the Klan, sundry anti-communist associations, which would segue into post-World War II McCarthyism, Stop ERA, the Tea Party, and the Susan B. Anthony List. White social justice suffragists helped found the ACLU. They worked for international peace and improving factory conditions. Among the most controversial causes of these women was birth control. Public health pioneer Margaret Sanger believed that birth control would reduce abortions among poor women. She founded the American Birth Control League in 1921, which was renamed Planned Parenthood in the 40s to avoid any association with Sanger. She was still controversial when she introduced the pill in 1960. Alice Paul had only one cause, the a new Equal Rights Amendment, which she introduced on the 75th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1923. The ERA was opposed for decades by Democrats, labor unions, and the League of Women Voters, which CAT had founded. Eight white women's organizations formed the Women's Joint Congressional Committee to pass the Shepherd Towner Act addressing maternal and infant health issues, the Cable Act to enfranchise married, uh, women married to foreigners, the Child Labor Amendment to create the first federal prison for women and to add physical education for girls to public school curriculum. Failure of women to turn out in the 1924 election resulted in the Shepherd Towner Act not being with reauthorized, the child labor amendment not being ratified, and no other major legislation affecting women passing for several decades. In 1920, both parties had vied for, women's, for women voters and then ignored them until women like Eleanor Roosevelt and Molly Dusen worked behind the scenes in the Democratic Party, resulting in uh, the appointments of Frances Perkins, the first woman to serve in the cabinet, and Mary McLeod Bethune's role in the New Deal. Nor did parties encourage women to run for office. Uh, only one woman served in the Senate in the 1920s. This is Rebecca Felton, Democrat of Georgia. She was 87, a famous suffragist and white supremacist. She served long enough to cast one vote and for this photo opportunity. 11 women served in the House, eight Republicans and three Democrats in the entire decade. Most were there as widows or daughters and served short terms but two served long enough to accrue power. Mary Norton, a Democrat, chaired the labor committee that would pass the Fair Labor Standards Act, and Edith Rogers, a Republican, served 36 years and passed the GI Bill. Looking back over a century since the 19th Amendment, we know that women count as citizens, voters, activists, and office holders. Women are a critical constituency in the upcoming presidential election. The power of black women as a cohort with the highest turnout and most party loyalty has put a woman on the democratic ticket. But black, brown and poor citizens are still suppressed. Legislation and court decisions do not end sexism and racism. Women will never be a unified block, but some of us can come together as agents of change. Thanks, Betsy. Next up, Dorothy Patton will discuss what we the people truly means as she details some key legislative accomplishments by women since 1920. Here's Dorothy. Thank you, Lisa. I first want to start by thanking the DC Bar for its commitment to commem commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Amidst all the turmoil of 2020, it would have been easy to cancel this celebration. But perhaps 2020 
is showing through the crisis of public health, the crises of income inequality and unequal justice, and the crisis of our very institutions of government, that 2020 is the perfect time to stop and reflect on America's democracy. Democracy. The word comes from two Greek words, demos, klasia, the people govern. And it was the notion of the people that the suffragists took to heart. As Elaine and Betsy have already so eloquently described, the suffragists knew that we, the people, should include all the people. My role on this panel is to show what has happened since we, the people, took on new meaning in 1920. Consider this Exhibit A, Why Democracy Matters. As Betsy noted, citizenship was the hook in the 19th Amendment, and that left out a lot of people. Native Americans on reservations, Asian immigrants who could not become citizens, and American citizens who lost their citizenship when they married non-citizens. The former suffragists did not take on the ethnic bias of citizenship straight away, but one of their first items of business was that marriage problem. A group of 500,000 former suffragists joined forces to lobby Congress for the Married Women's Independent Citizenship Act, also known as the Cable Act. When thousands of women descended on the White House and confronted President Warren Harding, he promptly signed it in September of 1922. So immediately after gaining the right to vote, women started working to make government more responsive to the needs of more of the people. That's democracy. As Elaine and Betsy, as Elaine and Betsy have shown, women are diverse and they certainly have never agreed on everything. But I do see some themes in what women leaders have accomplished in the past 100 years. I'll highlight three of them. Expanding opportunity, supporting healthy and safe families, and promoting fairness. First, expanding opportunity. Minnesota Representative Koya Knudsen expanded educational opportunity. After the Soviet launch of the Sputnik satellite in 1957, America became laser focused on education. Representative Knudsen, a former teacher said, we can't take the risk of limiting education to only those who can afford it. She introduced Title II of the National Defense Education Act of 1958 that committed $1 billion to higher education and created the first federal student loans. Before Congress allowed the program to expire in 2017, those so-called Perkins loans helped more than 30 million students of modest means earn a college degree. Hawaii Representative Patsy Takamoto Mink expanded educational and athletic opportunities. As a high school athlete, she and other girls were barred from playing full court basketball because it was too strenuous for them. So Patsy Mink wrote Title IX to the Education Amendments of 1972, which prohibits sex discrimination in all aspects of educational programs that receive federal funding. It has had an extraordinary impact. In the year before Title IX, only 3% of girls participated in organized sports. Today, about 43% do. Title IX has made the W. NBA and America's Women's World Cup champions possible. Barbara Boxer of California expanded opportunities for small businesses by improving the government contracting process. 
Her Small Business and Federal Procurement Competition Enhancement Act improved transparency and increased the availability of information about the federal contracting process, helping small businesses compete for lucrative government federal contracts. The second theme that I'll highlight is supporting healthy and safe families. Ohio Representative Frances Bolton improved public health. Her Nursing Training Act of 1943 established the U.S. Cadet Nurse Corps to train medical professionals and to invest in medical technology. Unique for its time, the Act's $165 million in grants were awarded to all schools, regardless of the students they served, creating opportunities for African-American, Native American, and Asian American women. It led to improvements in convalescent and psychiatric care and much more. Representative Pat Schroeder of Colorado championed work-life balance. Her Family and Medical Leave Act entitles workers to 12 weeks of unpaid leave per year for the birth or adoption of a child, for the care of a child, spouse, or parent, or for their own serious health condition. It continues to be a critical support for stable and healthy working families. Senators Dianne Feinstein of California and Kay Bailey Hutchison of Texas created the national system to promote, to locate missing and abducted children. Today, Amber Alerts are broadcast on television, in road signs and cell phones in the United States and 27 other countries. To date, they have resulted in the safe return of more than 1,000 missing children. The third theme that I'll highlight is promoting fairness. Labor Secretary Frances Perkins and House Labor Committee Chair Mary Norton of New Jersey joined forces to establish the first federal minimum wage, 25 cents per hour, in the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Their idea of requiring employers to pay a fair and living wage was initially vilified by industry as unconstitutional, anti-competitive, a violation of the right to contract. But consider the arc of history. Today, we don't debate whether there should be a minimum wage, but whether it should be 12 or $15 per hour. Finally, the Equal Pay Act of 1963 was drafted by labor leader Esther Peterson and shepherded through Congress by Catherine St. George of New York and Edith Green of Oregon. It required equal pay for women and men for equal work. An unfortunate Supreme Court decision in 2007 with the late great Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg dissenting showed that equal pay needed a booster shot. It came in the form of Maryland Senator Barbara Mikulski's Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act in 2009. I love all of these examples because they show how women's diverse personal experiences were brought to bear on how they governed. They made their government more responsive to the needs of all the people. That's democracy. Then let me note that my book includes a little pie chart that tracks the proportion of women to men in the US Congress decade by decade, beginning in 1920. It starts at the end of the 70th Congress in 1929 with the tiniest little sliver of pie. And then for the most part, it grows slowly decade by decade. And it ends with today's 100 16th Congress, in which even with record numbers, women comprise only 24% of the US Congress, but we comprise 50.8% of the population. Social science has shown that diverse decision-making bodies produce better outcomes in innovation, 
working environments, and financial performance. We still have much to gain by increasing women in government leadership. Thanks, Dorothy, Elaine, and Betsy for those incredible insights on the journey to equality for women. Now let's delve a little deeper into some of the key moments you raised. I wanna start by talking a little bit about Seneca Falls, 1848, July, and this first major women's rights gathering is organized on the home turf of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she and her peers come up with this document, the Declaration of Sentiments, Grievances, and Resolutions. And it has some language that's very familiar. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Betsy, could you take us behind some of the brainstorming to get to not only this preamble language, but to the 11 resolutions that they come up with? Lisa, you put your finger though on one of the most radical elements of the Declaration of Sentiments. Suffrage, the suffrage movement grew out of the abolition movement. These women had been activists. Lucretia Mott had been head of the Philadelphia Female Anti-Suffrage Association. So it was normal when you had a meeting to draft a document that the participants would vote on. Stanton's innovation was to copy the Declaration of Independence. So when you said equality of men and women, women of course were not in the Declaration of Independence. Every participant would have known those words and as soon as they heard women would have gasped, heads up, wait, what's going on here? Um, so even to frame the idea of women's suffrage within the founding document of the Republic was radical and bold in some ways more important than everything else other than the resolution about suffrage. But again, the resolutions are important because women in the 19th century, white women in the 19th century, freed black women had no rights. Um, Elaine outlined no rights to your clothing, your wages, your inheritance, your children, your body. Um, so to enumerate that they would like some more rights and would like to be able to speak in public and preach in churches and have access to commerce and the professions was a big deal. But nothing was as big as saying that women ought to have the right to vote. By chance, the um, AP News Wire Service had just hung telegraph wires in Seneca Falls. So when the women made this claim, it became national news and was immediately attacked by ministers and newspaper editors, making it an even more newsworthy event because the opponents, well, and just about everybody was outraged because no one thought that women ought to vote. It was not an appropriate behavior for women. Thanks, Betsy. Speaking of the right to vote, Elaine, you write in great detail in your book about the controversy surrounding resolution number nine that sacred right to the elective franchise. Can you tell us a little bit about why this, this uh, resolution was so controversial? Well, the right to vote is also a symbol of equality. And so in Stanton's um, declaration of, of, of uh, sentiments, she included um, ideas, uh, as, as Betsy just explained, that were considered so radical, so outrageous, um, uh, in, including, I should say, they're very modern, um, equal pay for equal work is one of those uh, sentiments. Uh, so the idea of voting um, is uh, considered such a departure from how the nation has been working for the past hundred years almost, that um, it's, it's controversial even among these uh, reformers and activists, these 300 men and women who are sitting in the uh, Wesley Chapel in Seneca Falls. And um, the idea that it's Frederick Douglass who has to stand up and convince the others, other very reluctant participants to endorse this, um, this idea of the vote, the ultimate uh, symbol of equality and, citizen, and equal citizenship um, is, is so, 
I think, meaningful. Um, I think if it was not for Frederick Douglass convincing the others by saying, you must be willing to fight for this, it will, the vote will never be given to you as women and never be given to me as a black man unless we are willing to demand it and to fight for it. If he didn't do that, I think we'd never have heard of Seneca Falls. You know, it, it, that meeting would not have been as meaningful. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, we look at Seneca Falls, even though clearly it's not the first time this has been discussed, um, as that break point when women say, um, you know, there are all these rights that we do not have. And remember, it is a women's rights convention at Seneca Falls. That's how it's advertised. It's not just a suffrage convention. Um, the, the movement will narrow its focus over time to concentrate on the vote as the linchpin, uh, the, the sort of uh, turnkey that will allow women to achieve the other votes. But at Seneca Falls, they're looking at a broad array of rights that are denied women and the right to vote becomes the, uh, the tool that they'll use and concentrate on in order to solve the other problems. Thank you, Elaine. So before Seneca Falls, as you noted in your presentation, Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, and others sharpened their activist chops in the abolitionist movement. Elaine, how did their work in that movement prepare them for the push to win women the right to vote? And what was the inflection point where they moved from that work to women's suffrage? Well, yes, these women, uh, the women we call the four mothers, uh, Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, Susan Anthony, Elizabeth Stanton, are all working in the abolition movement. And it, again, the idea of women's rights emerges from the idea of uh, the rights of enslaved people. And so um, what they learn to do in the abolition movement is first get up and speak in public, which was considered totally in, improper for a woman to do. It was considered, it was described as being promiscuous if a woman stood up, especially if there was a man in the audience. So that's the first thing they learn and, and demand to do. Um, they also learn to organize. They learn to persuade. They learn bravery because they're actually risking their lives in this abolition movement, going around and speaking. Uh, this famous story of Lucretia Mott, um, uh, the place where she, the auditorium where she is speaking is set on fire by, um, those who oppose the idea of abolition of freeing the slaves. And so she, she leads everyone out of that calmly, out of that burning building. So these women learn what adversity is of working for a cause, of um, organizing women and men and persuading them about the, the essence of democracy. The essence of democracy is both freedom for, for the enslaved and also to have full rights. So I think it is truly a training ground uh, for, the, for the women who will then uh, turn their attention to suffrage. Thanks, Elaine. Betsy, I'm gonna to go to you next. In a related question, how did the 14th and 15th amendments split abolitionists and suffragists? While Seneca Falls might be one starting point for the women's suffrage movement, the post-civil rights, the post-civil war amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, uh, create a huge schism and a new beginning. Um, I want to provide a little bit of context though. These heroic radical abolitionists were a pretty small group of the population. Um, I'd say 500 members, maybe max, um, uh, maybe, maybe more nationally, but the leadership cohort was probably 50. These were idealists, these were radicals. They had thought that they would be rewarded after the Civil War. In terms of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, politically naive. No Republican congressman in control of the Congress was going to give universal suffrage to women, black or white, to immigrants, to Native Americans, 
It was not a popular idea. It got seven votes in the Congress to pass universal suffrage. That didn't make it any less offensive when the 14th Amendment in the second clause defined citizenship as male, because all these women had always thought they were American citizens. And when the 15th Amendment appropriately gives the vote to black men. The suffragists and the abolitionists made the case that black women were just as vulnerable, if not more so, and needed the protection of the vote. But if you were going to enfranchise black women, then you needed to enfranchise white women. And so the whole idea seemed impossible to the power brokers. The language used by a small faction led by Stanton, Anthony, and this kooky radical named George Francis Train was blatantly racist offensively racist, and sometimes um, overpowers, on, d d d creates a change of balance in how we assess Stanton, because there's clearly strengths and weaknesses. But, it, but, the, but that division, that offensive language, creates a racist division in which Black people stop trusting some white liberals. And so after 1870, they don't work together very often. The 15th Amendment gives black men the right to vote, which is protected briefly until 1876, and then the Reconstruction troops are pulled out and Jim Crow ascends. So black women in their own communities are doing everything they can to protect their communities from lynching and Jim Crow, so they have a path to go to. White women divide. Um, the Stanton Anthony tiny faction become the feisty radical National Women's Suffrage Association, which takes up all those causes, um, more causes, birth control, divorce reform, communal living, um, were charged with free love, advocating free love. They were clearly on the fringe. Um, and uh, Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell, and the American Women's Suffrage Association will go in another direction. Not only did they have different backgrounds, but they had different strategies. Stanton and Anthony were going for a federal amendment. Stone thought she would just fight state by state, which would eventually could lead to a federal amendment. So you have the founding generation of these visionary women um, dividing over race, negating the role of a lot of prominent black abolitionists and suffragist men and women. Um, and it's a huge break point that marks all the future of the women's suffrage movement. Thanks, Betsy. Um, I wanna come back to you really quickly on two of the organizations you just mentioned, um, the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. And as you know, in 1890, they united to form a supergroup, the National American Women's Suffrage Association. How did they go about getting over their stark differences over the amendments that divided them and any other issues? Um, the short answer might be that they were losing. Both sides uh, were suffering from um, exhausting, expensive campaigns. Uh, they, had not, uh, they had not really made much progress at all. The other answer is that these uh, founding mothers were aging. They were all pretty old. All credit goes to Susan B. Anthony. She was really an institutionalist. She thought about succession planning. She thought about who was going to move this movement ahead. So she persuades Stanton and Stone, Stone really represented by her daughter, Alice Blackwell, that there should be a new movement. We would all work together. Stanton was pretty indifferent. By that time, she was pursuing um, really broader ideas about uh, really definitions of feminism and things that were, she said, I don't wanna sing suffrage evermore. There are many more issues. And she was pursuing those to the great embarrassment of younger women. <laughs> Stone was old and ill. She would die in, I think, 1892. So these women have, tit have, they have titular roles, but Anthony's running the show and she recruits the next generation led by Carrie Chapman Catt and Anna Howard Shaw. And those two women are so different than these founding um, leaders. They are politicians. They are going to focus on how to get the votes. They will become increasingly racist and nativist in their language and their tactics. Uh, and, and Anthony, who will, um, well, and as they are becoming more political, they drum Elizabeth Cady Stanton out of the National American Women's Suffrage Association because she has had the audacity to publish the Women's Bible, blaming a lot of sexism, I could say rightfully, on the language of Judeo-Christian tradition that women are secondary, that men are masters, 
all of those issues. But they were just so completely embarrassed by that heresy in 1895 <laughs> that they threw her out, which was a really moral question for Susan B. Anthony. Her best friend has just been censored and she allows it to happen. She then rises to power in NASA in uh, 1900. She'll pass the baton to um, Kat for her first presidency. Kat will um, resign and uh, Anna Howard Shaw, who was a doctor and a, um, a minister takes over for a while. And then Kat comes back in in 1915 and really leads NASA to the victories in Congress and in the ratification campaign that Elaine has written about. Um, so it's interesting how um, people always used to say that Stanton forged the thunderbolts and Anthony fired them. Stanton was sort of the philosopher and Anthony was the organizer. And so she really moves the, moves the organization into a next generation by creating the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Thanks, Betsy. Um, so I, I wanna talk a bit about a point that ran through all three of your presentations and it's this idea of intersectionality. This term was coined 30 years ago by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw um, to grapple with the idea that race and gender overlap in a certain way in the lived experiences of women that deal with both, so Black women and others. Um, and I'd like to talk about some of the prominent uh, Black suffragists in the movement. There was Ida B. Wells, the legendary journalist and anti-lynching advocate. There was Mary Church Terrell, the NACP co-founder and the NACW co-founder. And uh, there was her friend, Anna Julia Cooper. Um, and, and these women weren't necessarily, not necessarily, they weren't embraced by the larger movement, um, but they still carved out their place, right? As you mentioned, pushing simultaneously for suffrage and against lynching. Um, so Dorothy, in your book, you talk about the 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade right here in DC. And you talk about the fact that there's a section for women in the front, there's a section for white men right behind that. And then all the way in the back, there was a section for Negro women. And as Ida B. Wells says, essentially in today's terminology, not today, <laughs> she decides she is moving up to march with her state delegation, which is Illinois. And um, Dorothy, I was wondering, as you were, were researching for your book, did you ever see any sort of recognition or idea from some of the major movement leaders that there needed to be a bigger tent and a grappling with the concerns of diverse suffragists? And this question is actually for everyone, but I'd like to start with Dorothy. Well, for women of color, it, it was just, it was always the whole thing. I mean, we're living at the intersection. I can't, I can't separate out the gender issues and the race issues because I'm living both of them every day. And Ida B. Wells is just a lovely example of, of embodying both and never sacrificing, never selling out one or the other. It's both. And she knows they all know, the women of color know that it's a matter of their very survival to, to, to fight for all of the, uh, for equality in, on, in all of these fronts. Um, another woman I came across in my research was Mary Ann Shad Carey, who was so extraordinary, born in 1823, an African-American to uh, free parents in Delaware. Consider this, she testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee about how great the 14th and 15th Amendments were, but she said right then, I'm offended that it doesn't include the women too. Mm -hmm. It just was, it would never be lost upon them that it's, that everyone needs to be part of the democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Elaine, do you wanna jump in on this one? Sure. Um, you know, the, the march is, is such an interesting example. Um, it, in the, there have been numerous um, e exhibits of celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment in the past year or so. And there's very interesting documents, I believe it was in the National Archives exhibit, mm -hmm. um, that showed the correspondence between the national leaders at that time, it's Anna Howard Shaw, who's leading NASA, and Alice Paul, who is 
uh, not yet broken away, but uh, spiritually she has. And she's in charge of organizing the 1913 National March. And they say to her in these letters, we hear that you want to segregate this march. And we think that's a bad idea. Uh, so, that, so here you see, you know, it's complicating our usual narrative. Um, they're saying, you should not do this. And Alice Paul uh, responds, yes, but the Southern women won't march. The Southern suffragists won't march if we allow black women to be a, among them. And so this, so, so you see a, a, a tension even within the highest ranks of the movement. And then there's the lovely um, coda to the story, which is not usually told, which is when um, Ida breaks into the center of the march and um, mar enters to be with her Illinois delegation who had opposed her being uh, uh, separated from them, absolutely opposed it. Um, they, the white women, embrace her and she marches shoulder to shoulder with them. And in that uh, one famous photograph that we have, she is marching with them and they um, are celebrating that. So we have to remember, this is much more complicated than just saying there's racism and that's it. There certainly is, but we, we need to also identify those moments when there is collaboration. Absolutely. There are, there are all these ironies as we were pointing out. Alice Paul is a Quaker. The organizing original abolitionists were Quakers, and yet she gets caught up in this racism. And she, uh, the original idea to have women march came from two groups. Um, Mary Church Terrell's the National Association of Colored Women said, could she bring her whole organization? Paul panicked. And then the newly formed um, Delta Sigma Thetas of the, the sorority at Howard said they all wanted to come. And uh, Paul's response was, well, I'm not organizing a march for black women or for Native American women, what's going on? So then after a lot of pressure, she puts them in the back. But um, Ida B. Wells had come with the Illinois delegation. She was practicing the marching with them when Alice Stone Blackwell, Lucy's daughter, the daughter of a founding abolitionist comes and says, no, no, you can't march with Illinois and pulls her out. Nobody's quite sure where Terrell marched, but, um, the, the rear section, as reported by W.E.B. Du Bois in the crisis, reported that there were 42 African-American women and a few men who came to chaperone them. Um, Paul was aware that Washington was a Southern city, but she handled it very shabbily. And that became, and it had, didn't even start in 1913, but since 1890, the issue of how you were gonna pass suffrage through a Congress dominated by men who brought all of their racial and regional bias, created a political conundrum for the organizers. How were they gonna win those votes? So thanks, Bessie. Um, at the same time that you all are talking about these moments, right, where um, white suffragists and black suffragists are working together or they're sort of navigating the spaces in which they jointly occupy. Um, and I think both, both Elaine and Betsy mentioned this earlier. Um, the idea of Black women voting in mass is presented forcefully as a reason, not the only reason, but as a reason why uh, politicians shouldn't support suffrage, right? Elaine, you tell the very compelling story about uh, the Tennessee governor's sort of Hamlet movement. He's got this moment of angst where he's hearing all the reasons why he should and back suffrage, he shouldn't call the special session for ratification. And one of the things that's mentioned, in addition to the idea of corporate interests being against suffrage, is this idea that all of these Black women are going to vote in mass. How do we get to the point where he hears that, you know, he hears the advice from the, his advisors, but he goes on to go ahead and call the special session? Well, you won't be surprised to hear it's political. Um, the governor, Governor Albert Roberts, is a very interesting case of a man who gets persuaded to, to really champion ratification in his state. And I will say right at the outset, he pays the price. Um, he is he loses re-election in the fall of 1920 because of his advocacy of ratification of the 19th Amendment in Tennessee. But the arguments being used in Tennessee uh, in that summer of 1920. Uh, to, to thwart 
ratification are mostly racial. And um, basically, uh, virtually all, not all, but virtually all of the um, other Southern states have already rejected the amendment, including Maryland, um, and including even more moderate border states like Delaware. And there, there's corporate interests involved too, but, um, and even in New Jersey, it's very close. They almost lose it there. So I think it's important to, uh, to realize that the idea of black women voting is such an anathema in these Southern states that um, they are willing to um, deny the vote to all women uh, if, if they can um, it, to prevent that. Another reason they're so afraid of it, they talk about, and you see this in the, in the commentary and even in the broadsides in Nashville, they're afraid of enforcement of the 14th Amendment. The, there's a clause, second section of the 14th Amendment says that should a state deny uh, eligible voters the vote, they will be punished. They can be punished, not will. They can be punished by the um, uh, diminishing of their representation in Congress. They will lose their Congress representation in proportion to the uh, afflicted population um, compared to the whole. So basically what the anti-suffragists do in Tennessee is they say, look, if this federal bill passes, and the, you know, the Washington can now look in our, in our polling places and see whether we're allowing women to vote, then they'll notice we've not been enforcing the 15th Amendment and we might lose, and they actually have charts, we may lose 11 congressmen, of course they're all men at that time, or Mississippi will lose this many, 13, um, and they go down the list of how in danger their representation in Congress. And of course, we know that the South has disproportionate power in Congress at this time. So it's a very complicated situation that they are facing because they realize that the nation might notice what they're doing, uh, denying black people to vote already. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Betsy, as you discussed, the amendment enfranchised 27 million women, um, including at least by law, black women. Um, but in reality, many don't have the opportunity to exercise the vote. There are still poll taxes, there are grandfather clauses, and there is violence, right? Um, against not only black men who seek to vote, but black women as well. Um, can you talk about some of the barriers that existed after uh, ratification of the 19th, and um, not only for Black women, but for the others who were not included in the text of the 19th. I'm going to go to you first, Betsy, then I'll ask Dorothy to weigh in. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Lisa, everything you just listed about the discriminatory practices that state, um, state parties and state law put in place regarding voting applied to Blacks throughout the South, and then other kinds of biases applied um, and the threat of violence applied to blacks wherever they were voting because this um, great migration that moved African-Americans out of the South during the period beginning around um, 1915 into the end of the depression meant that Northern populations were much more um, mixed than they had been and that was unsettling. And so people met it with violence. They didn't like competition for jobs. They didn't like people living in their neighborhoods. So it, so there was lots of tension. Um, and there was really, there were very few advo advocacy groups supporting or protecting African-Americans or poor people or other out groups. Um, the poll tax hurt everybody. A poll tax could be as high as five or $10. And if you're a couple, it's hard to come up with the $10, much less come up with $20. That was a huge break. And it doesn't change until the 24th Amendment in 1963. And I, I want to add that while these um, inhibitions hurt people of color the most, it's also true that white women felt very uncomfortable voting because they'd been told for generations that they were incapable of voting. It was inappropriate for women to vote. It was manly for women to vote. They would destroy the family if they voted. 
Um, African-American women actually came up with the best response to that. A, a black woman who was named to the um, Republican National Committee made the case that African-American women would spend no more time voting than they spend in their weekly church volunteer work um, and made the case that of course they're capable of voting. Um, but there was this, not only was there embedded racial prejudice and xenophobia, but the sexism applied to women in every category that they should not be voting. Took a long time. Women don't vote in large numbers. They really don't begin to vote in even equal numbers until 1952. And then they don't vote in measurable important numbers until 1980. Anybody else wanna weigh in on that question? No. Well, I'd like okay. to bring it up to today. If, okay, if go ahead, Dorothy, go ahead. Because, <laughs> you know, the voter suppression of, of yesteryear, the literacy tests, the poll taxes, just the blatant racism and sexism have, have given way to new forms of voter suppression today in the states. We could have a whole panel just on that. Um, we've seen in North Dakota, a state law that essentially disenfranchised 70% of Navajo people because in order to register to vote, you have to have a street address. People, Many people on reservations don't have a street address. And the tribal ID is not permitted to be an acceptable form of identification. We have Florida where the overwhelming majority of people, citizens of Florida decided that uh, former felons who had served their time should be able to uh, register to vote, to have their, their voting rights restored. And then six months later, the state passes a law that says, you know, not just the, uh, the serving of the time is, is necessary, but also you have to have paid all your fines and fees. But guess what? The fines and fees are never available on on a website and a book and a database so that people know how much they how much they owe it's just it's just blatant um in kansas in florida in georgia we have the purging of of voter rolls for absurd reasons like you know i first registered as dorothy Patton and and then i show up as dorothy p Patton, or that my name is close to the name of 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 a felon or in Kansas that I didn't vote in the last three elections and they're just stripped out of the rolls. It's absurd. Um, in Idaho, uh, your, your gun permit is a valid form of identification, but not a university student ID. It just goes on and on. I could really go on and on, but the, the thing that I really want this little snippet to show is that States' actions matter. And when we talk about voting, people are often focused on the federal national elections, but those decisions about where we vote, about how we vote, um, about how you register to vote, those decisions are made at the local and the state levels. The, um, the national leadership Council for uh, National Leadership Forum for Human and Civil Rights has counted 1,700 polling stations that have been closed since 2013, since the Shelby decision. Those are state decisions. So we have to make sure that we are voting on the local and state level as well as the federal level. Yes. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, so I want to ask the big question, one of the big questions that happened after ratification. And, and so um, Dorothy, thank you for fast forwarding to some of the parallels between the present and the time immediately following ratification. I think uh, it's spot on to consider some of these concerns that endure. One of the big questions I had and that you all answer in various ways in your books are, is what happened to the anti-suffragists after ratification? Where do they go? Um, and uh, Dorothy, you talk about in your book, the Shepherd Towner Act of 1921, right? This big major healthcare funding act for mothers and children. And the anti-suffragists show up there. Um, I wanna ask you about some of the influence that they had in Congress 
And this question is actually for everyone. So uh, Elaine and Dor- Elaine and Betsy, I'd love you to weigh in as well. But Dorothy, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I mean, the Shepherd Towner is the first time that you've that you can see the benefit of having a woman at the table. Women, and that's that's the whole point here. You're bringing your your lived experience to the table, to the governance of the country, and it makes all the difference in the world. Shepherd Towner provides uh, health care to women, to babies, where it's desperately needed. And Jeanette Rankin is the one who, who knows. Women need help in pre, with prenatal care. Um, I, I hope that people take a second to find this wonderful clip that you can find on YouTube from 2009, and this encapsulates exactly the beauty of having a woman at the table. It's a debate in this in a Senate committee about uh, what benefits have to be part of federal um, health insurance policies. And you've got John Kyle of Arizona sitting there, kind of gruff and grumbling, and he's saying, I don't know why uh, I should have higher premiums that cover maternity care. I don't need maternity care. And Debbie Stavenow of Michigan punches on her microphone and says, without missing a beat, but your mother did. You know, every woman in the room was just uplifted. Right. Her voice at the table made the difference right then and there. The whole point is, and and it's not just about health and heart, you know, hearth and family. Women bring their diverse backgrounds to bear, their lived experiences to bear on everything. Uh, uh, Val, Val Demings started her career as a mental health professional, and then she became a police officer. When she came to Congress, guess what she did? She funded mental health care for police officers. Uh, Nydia Velasquez of New York saw organized crime on her streets in New York. She comes to Congress and she says, you know what, we need a national strategy to to combat financial crimes and money laundering. So everyone, women, men, everyone brings their lived experience to the table. And that's the value of having diversity in our democracy. But including the antis. Jeanette Rankin uh, was not in the Congress when Shepard Towner passed. She was sitting in the gallery. It was a bipartisan bill, but it was opposed by the only woman representative um, sitting in 1921, Alice Robertson from Oklahoma, who voted against it. So the antis are still with us. Um, and our parties have become more um, divisive, more antis on one side possibly than the other. But I do think that women in office do a better job of attempting to find common ground on a whole raft of issues that affect all of us. Mm -hmm. And I I will say that um, having traced that maternal line from the anti-suffragists who really do get stronger, uh, not only uh, opposing Shepard Towner, but then going into the anti-communist, uh, scares and you see them pop up. They accuse Carrie Cat of being a communist in 1929. So they're still at it. Uh, they they actually embrace their power. They get very good at organizing and in succession planning. Um, and so we see that line through the, the McCarthy era. And then of course, um, it's Phyllis Schlafly who is trained in these same organizations uh, who will uh, bring her Eagle Forum to fight the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. And we see the uh, latter day anti-suffragists with us today. Thank you all. Um, so this is our last question. And uh, we are now in 2020 uh, with all that that means, as uh, Dorothy alluded to earlier, we've had one, women run for president or vice president and land seats in every other elected role imaginable. And there are still barriers, as you all have discussed throughout this discussion, uh, to the vote. And being that we're now weeks away from election day and many are already voting, I'm wondering what each of you would tell us about what Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Ida B. Wells and all of the others might advise us to do today 
to make sure we're all exercising our right? This question's for all of you, and I'm going to start with Dorothy. Thanks, Lisa. You know, I found it interesting in listening to the other talks to, uh, to think that so many of the women we have discussed were journalists, were readers, were teachers. I think that the suffragists would remind us that we need to stay informed. Um, education is, is so critical to knowing what the current issues are and, and to arm us to participate. Um, I think just sitting around the table and having a discussion about current events is, is so valuable and it promotes our ability to, to engage. It passes on the tradition of voting to the next generation, which is so critical. You know, democracy is not a spectator sport as my friend in Loudoun County it tells me. It only works when the people are engaged. So take that passion of the suffragists into the voting booth every single time and be the people. Thank you, Dorothy. That's it. Well, I'm a person um, who's passionate about politics and not very patient. So it's hard for me to accept Elizabeth Cady Stanton's words about this is winter wheat we are sowing, other hands than ours will harvest it. But if you think how long it took to get suffrage and then how long it took to get the Voting Rights Act and that we are still working on voter suppression, it means you can never stop fighting. You have to educate, what was it that Susan said? Educate, organize, agitate. We need to be in the streets. And Elaine. Well, I totally agree. I think the suffragists, frankly, would be rather appalled that at this century later, uh, the representation in Congress is only 24% female. In the state legislatures, only 20, I think 3% now, and this is the highest it's ever been. And of course, we still, when we have women candidates, either for the presidency or the vice presidency, we're still having debates. Can America elect a woman for the highest um, uh, position in the land? And of course, the other democracies of the world laugh at us and say, get over it. We have done this for years. And so there is this sort of juvenile approach to women in political power. Uh, you know, we're, we're still using the same arguments of, is she too loud? Is she too aggressive? Is she too smart? Um, that were used against the suffragists. So I think um, I agree with Betsy and Dorothy. We have to still be in the fight. And it's not just for women now. Of course, it is. Uh, those issues are still unresolved. But again, protecting the right to vote for all citizens is our job. And um, not allowing it to be discussed as a partisan issue because it truly isn't and diminishes our capability to, uh, to resolve it. And uh, so we, we still need to be educating, agitating and organizing and, and be in the fight. Thank you so much, Elaine, Dorothy and Betsy for a really incredible discussion. So um, at this point in the program, we are going to answer some questions that have come in from our chat room from the audience. And remember, you can submit your questions in the box right below your video screen. So let's see what we have for the first question. Here is one uh, from Abigail. W.B. Du Bois, founder of the NACP, during his time as an editor of The Crisis, wrote more than 20 essays supporting women's suffrage. He also spoke at a National American Women's Suffrage Association convention, but he was critical of movement leaders who were either sympathetic to white supremacy or didn't challenge them for fear of upsetting support for suffrage in the South. What did you all make of his critique and do you think it made any impact on the movement? Betsy, would you like to start with this one? I think his critique was accurate. Um, and I, I don't imagine it had any impact. 
these um, these women, you know, we could spend a lot of time on defining how deeply racist they were or not. Um, but in their day-to-day -day life, they were politicians trying to launch a campaign, trying to trying to win a campaign in which they were the minority and they had no power. It was only as state by state women gained presidential suffrage, which gave them power in the parties and in the electoral college, and in many states allowed them to elect members of Congress as well, that they began to have any influence at all. But that was taking forever. I think um, by 1918, they had 17 states, um, not, even, not even half yet. And so to win, they had to um, pull people in in whatever ways they could. Kat felt that Paul, who, who had um, worked in the British suffrage movement under the Pankhurst sisters in a parliamentary system, Paul wanted to hold the Democrats as the party in power. They had not only the presidency, but the majority of both houses until 1918 um, responsible. And Kat called that stupendously stupid because you needed bipartisan support. She needed every vote she could get and she worked for every vote she could get. Frankly, it's remarkable that the white National American Women's Suffrage Association was able to hold off the Southern efforts to pass a white only suffrage amendment. Uh, it was quite narrow vote and they were clearly pressed by Terrell and um, National Association of Colored Women and lots of black um, sort of allies because they were also antagonists on some issues. But um, the fact that they were able to pass um, a woman's suffrage amendment that was going to include everybody was a huge deal. And that was their goal. And they cut corners and made morally questionable decisions, uh, uh, but they got it done. And that gave us a starting point um, from, which, from which we could build. So uh, the critiques are right, uh, but the reality uh, is also part of the picture. Thank you. Elaine? I totally agree with what Betsy says about the Du Bois editorials. I've read many of them and read the uh, special women's suffrage issues of the crisis. And Du Bois is a fascinating participant in these debates. He is in, in many ways a, a, a son, a spiritual son of Frederick Douglass in, in that he supports uh, uh, universal suffrage. And one of the interesting things, again, his critique is spot on. He calls out the hypocrisy uh, of some of the, the movement leaders and their uh, approach to, to gaining uh, political acceptance. Uh, for the movement and for the federal amendment. But in 1915, when um, he invites actually uh, the women's suffrage leaders, Kat, Anna Howard Shaw, several others to write in the crisis, making their case for, for suffrage at, in New York, because it was, under, it was up for referendum. It was up to a vote where only what, men could vote, of course. And one of the things he does say is that he chides black men uh, and says, you need to vote when you can vote because in the North, in mm -hmm. New York, they can vote. Black men can vote. And he says, you've got to vote for women's suffrage. You've got to support this. And here we see patriarchy taking uh, precedence over race even. Um, you know, black men are suspicious of this and with good reason because this will enfranchise more white women. But uh, it's also true that in uh, states which have referenda, uh, throughout the nation where black men are, can vote are not prohibited by Jim Crow laws. Uh, in many instances, they vote against the idea of women's suffrage and that's a patriarchy issue. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. Yep. Um, go ahead, Dorothy. Yeah. I, I agree with all that was said. I, it's, it's always disappointing when, when powerless people don't realize that they're, that alliances with other powerless people will actually help help them all. Um, and we've seen that really as, as part of the arc of history too, haven't we? Since, since the very beginning, there have been, you know, times, critical junctures when we 
we just kick the can of full equality and full fairness and and justice down the road a bit. Um, so it's it's unfortunate. It's at some point we need to say we really got to get this democracy right. Um, no no more kicking the can of justice and and fairness down the road. I want to I want to add though a note about those alliances. So. Clearly the National American Women's Suffrage Association, suffrage was its main goal, but all these other major groups in the 19th century, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the National Association of Colored Women, the Federation of Jewish Women, the General Federation of Women, all these people had a suffrage arm because all of them wanted, had reason to want the vote. They, were, they had an agenda that they wanted to enact once they got the vote, but had, for example, NASA allied with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Mm -hmm the largest women's organization in the 19th century would have brought in tons of supporters and Protestant churches. It would have made the brewers, the saloons, immigrant men, um, the Catholic church and democratic party bosses even more antagonistic because that was their constituency. So every time you allied with somebody, you might have gotten a lot of support and it might have created this coalition for justice, but it also strengthened the opponents. Um, so you had to be um, savvy and sometimes savvy is not um, admirable. Thank you all. There's another question that's in there that I think I'm gonna to go to Dorothy uh, uh, first. Um, and this is from Susie. The increasing polarization of our political system seems to have deterred some talented individuals mm -hmm. from engaging in the political uh, system, both men and women. Do you think um, it's having more of an impact on potential engagement by women? And if so, how can we overcome this barrier and encourage engagement? Dorothy. Yeah, it is a problem. I mean, part of the polariz the polarization is in part a function of our not functioning democracy though isn't it we have more extreme people because they're they're being elected in gerrymandered districts and they don't have to listen to to everyone and 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 come to the table and and debate in in good faith um i I, I'm, in, I'm heartened that there are, there are more women who are graduating from law school, there are more women who are educated than ever before, and that, of course, leads to more women running. Um, and, it's, and it's people from all, again, diverse backgrounds. It's, it, wouldn't it be great if we had more people who have worked for minimum wage serving in Congress? Um, because they'll understand that the minimum wage really should be a living wage. Um, a diversity of having a greater diversity at the table is, is going to help. And we just have to, to find those candidates and, and support those candidates to bring those new ideas to the table. Thank you. Um, another question comes in from Elizabeth. I am from upstate New York. What made that area so critical to the suffrage movement? Uh, Elaine, you wanna, uh, we'll start with you on that one. Well, upstate New York is often called the burnt over district in the mid 19th century. And it really was a fascinating cauldron of new ideas. It's where Mormonism starts, where uh, Joseph Smith has his vision. Um, it's where there are perfectionist uh, colonies being established, trying out new ways of living. Um, there's, uh, of course, a lot of revivalist religious uh, ferment where there are you know, big um, uh, religious conversions, mass conversions going on in upstate New York. Uh, so there's a lot of, it's also of course a central depot for the Underground Railroad. So you have a lot of reformers sort of um, moving there and um, establishing a, a, a very interesting society. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton grows up in upstate New York in Johnstown where her father is a judge. And she, her, her cousins are very, uh, Garrett Smith is a very radical abolitionist. So she grows up in this society of, of foment. That is why Frederick Douglass moves to Rochester. 
because the women, uh, the, the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society has actually bought his freedom. They have, they have um, you know, um, collected money for his freedom and he comes to Rochester to establish his newspaper, The North Star. So it's really this fascinating place. It, it's sort of the, the, the California of, <laughs> of, um, of new ideas in the mid 19th century. So it does make sense. The reason Seneca Falls meeting, that's just uh, because uh, that's where Elizabeth Stanton is living with her abolitionist organizer husband. And um, uh, there's, and she has a bunch of friends who are equally involved in the movement. And Lucretia Mott just happens to be visiting for a Quaker meeting. So the fact that it's in uh, Seneca Falls is really convenient, uh, but it was, um, it, it could draw within five days notice 300 or more people uh, to, the, to the meeting because it's the center of progressive thinking. Mm -hmm. Betsy, you wanna jump in? Or you, you good? Okay, <laughs> awesome, great. great. Um, so the next question that's come in is, uh, if I wanted to learn more, and this is presumably about the 19th Amendment, history of women's suffrage, what books would you recommend? Um, I will start with Betsy for that question. <laughs> Betsy's in Elaine's box. <laughs> <laughs> all of our books. But this question of suffrage is, is wider than the 19th Amendment. So while you might, there's a new book out by um, Ellen Du Bois called Suffrage. There's the classic Ellen Flexner's Century of Struggle. But um, anything by Paula Giddings about where and when I enter, African-American history, Lynn Olson's Freedom Daughters. And just recently, um, uh, a book, um, Vanguard. Uh, uh, Arthur Jones. Arthur Jones. Jones. Yeah. Jones Hopkins, about um, really the history of Black women in uh, achieving wider rights um, is, is making a major contribution. Mm -hmm. There are just tons. And I, I loved what Dorothy said about um, the importance of educating ourselves, yeah. both to be activists and to ed we, need the, we need civics education. Every yeah. kid in high school Absolutely. needs to know these stories um, because they are so important. Um, our founders, for all their flaws, wanted an educated population um, so that the democracy would grow and expand and change and move toward a more perfect union. Absolutely. And can I add on to that? Let's remember that there are many wonderful primary sources available. Um, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and you can access those right from your living room. Um, and they are wonderful sources that I, that I used for my book. Um, also, let's remember that there's a difference between social media and news media. Uh, we need to be using credible sources to educate ourselves um, and then and take that knowledge and, and go forth and participate in our democracy. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. And I totally agree with, with everything and would also recommend the PBS documentary uh, yes. that's available called The Vote. It's, uh, I think, a, a fantastic uh, overview of the movement and the visuals are just stupendous. And so I think uh, everyone... Even with the pandemic, when so many museum exhibits have had to close, they're mm -hmm. online. online. Archives, the Library of Congress, um, there's so many sources available. And again, thanks to the DC Bar for having a webinar like this one. Yay. Thank you. Well, thanks. Speaking of thanks, thanks to you all. Thanks, Betsy, Dorothy, Elaine, for a really riveting uh, discussion today. Thank and um, thank you to our audience who submitted questions as well. This is really amazing. This concludes our panel. And uh, please enjoy the rest of the DC Bar Conference. Thanks. Thank you to our moderator and panelists for taking part in such an instructive discussion. Now we will take a short break and return with more of the DC Bar 2020 Conference, 100 Years of the 19th Amendment.
At the DC Bar, we are driven by new ideas and technology. As the largest unified bar in the United States with more than 110,000 members, we continue to strive for excellence with service, integrity, and leadership for our members, our students, and our community. In upholding these standards, we are improving your online experience with a new design for our website. Please join us online at www.dcbar.org. The new DC Bar website simplifies how the content is organized, improves the navigation, and brings relevant information to your fingertips. Whether you access dcbar.org using a laptop, desktop, phone, or tablet, you will have the same ease of use and consistency because our new website is designed to work elegantly with all screens, from desktops to mobile devices. The content is strategically organized in three unique sections to ensure that lawyers, students, and members of the public can quickly and effectively find what they need. We understand that new can sometimes feel confusing, for this reason, we intentionally designed the new website to feel familiar and welcoming to our long-standing users who may be accustomed to the previous dcbar.org site. Our goal was to enhance and streamline the user experience while remaining true to our trusted mission and values. Improving on the previous blog-style site where visitors were faced with long paragraphs of text and non-categorized results, we've given the content a more intuitive organization using visual clues and graphic elements. We also identified the pages that are most frequently visited and made them accessible to our users with fewer clicks by either linking them directly from the home page or from the navigational bar. The new navigational toolbar has pulled down subcategories that will take you to your desired landing page with a consistent click-through experience. Our new search interface allows you to discover articles, documents, and news even faster, saving time and improving results. The search results can be narrowed further by choosing the website itself, Washington Lawyer, News, or the Pro Bono Center pages as the source of the information. The updated frequently asked questions are categorized and searchable and address your most relevant concerns. If you require further assistance, our contact page is designed to connect you easily with the right DC Bar staff member who will be able to address your questions. A priority of the new DC Bar strategic plan is to enhance member value by prioritizing ease of user experience and improving online and remote access to DC Bar programs and services. Especially now, when we are primarily engaging with our members online, this new website helps the Bar meet that important goal. Please visit the DC Bar's new website at dcbar.org. Equal justice under law. It's a bedrock principle of our American democracy. But every day in the nation's capital, thousands of people are denied equal access to justice simply because they cannot afford a lawyer. For more than 40 years, the DC Bar Pro Bono Center has mobilized volunteer lawyers to deliver legal information, advice, and representation where and when it's needed most. Together, we help people who have been left out to understand the law, assert their rights, and seek justice in court. In neighborhoods that have been left behind, we strengthen nonprofit organizations and small businesses that are vital to the economic life of their communities. We stand with people to protect and preserve what matters most, their families, their homes, their futures. Equal access to justice transforms lives. Join us. More than any other geographic location, the District of Columbia is associated with the practice of law and the administration of justice. The DC Bar is now the largest integrated bar in the United States, with more than 110,000 members from all 50 states and over 80 countries who practice in every conceivable area of law and include government, nonprofit, solo practice, 
and business settings and firms of all sizes. Here at the DC Bar, our mission is to serve our members so that they in turn can serve the community. Membership in the DC Bar entitles you to a variety of confidential, in many cases free, services and benefits. Whether you're contacting our legal ethics hotline, obtaining practice management guidance to build or grow your practice, talking to an expert counselor about addiction, stress, or wellness, attending a networking event, or participating in our annual celebration of leadership, our highly trained and responsive staff is ready to assist you. Our nationally accredited continuing legal education program offers hundreds of courses each year in a wide variety of practice areas, ensuring that you can earn CLE credits for any jurisdiction in the country. And here at the DC Bar, we develop future leaders in the law through the John Payton Leadership Academy. The DC Bar also has a long tradition of service, both to its members and to the public. The Bar's service to the public is best demonstrated through our award-winning Pro Bono Center, a national model for providing access to justice for those in our community who cannot afford a lawyer. A separate nonprofit legal services organization, the Pro Bono Center mobilizes 1,500 volunteer lawyers to serve more than 20,000 individuals, nonprofits, and small businesses annually through our full representation clinics, our court-based resource centers and attorneys of the day, and our neighborhood walk-in clinics, transforming lives by serving our clients where and when they need us most. The DC Bar is a dynamic organization, and much of this valuable work is done by volunteers, like you, participating on our committees, task forces, working groups, and in our communities. We encourage you to get involved and get to know your bar leaders. Our 21 communities have something to offer for everyone, regardless of practice area or experience. These communities provide content to their professional networks and peer groups and get the firsthand opportunity to hear from experts and officials in their field. We are heavily invested in building community. Our newest community is for the law students, and we are hoping to build a pipeline, not only to admission to the DC Bar and its communities, but to prospective employers as well. Students can take advantage of networking events, writing opportunities, mentoring relationships, and leadership programs right alongside our practicing members. Developing these future leaders and giving them the skill set to succeed is a key goal of our organization. I encourage you to explore our website, dcbar.org, where you can find detailed information about our diverse portfolio of program offerings, all of which are designed to reinforce our steadfast commitment to service, integrity, and leadership. Again, the DC Bar is here to assist you in making your practice a successful one. We are committed to serving our members so they can serve the community. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you.
At the DC Bar, we are driven by new ideas and technology. As the largest unified bar in the United States with more than 110,000 members, we continue to strive for excellence with service, integrity, and leadership for our members, our students, and our community. In upholding these standards, we are improving your online experience with a new design for our website. Please join us online at www.dcbar.org. The new DC Bar website simplifies how the content is organized, improves the navigation, and brings relevant information to your fingertips. Whether you access dcbar.org using a laptop, desktop, phone, or tablet, you will have the same ease of use and consistency because our new website is designed to work elegantly with all screens, from desktops to mobile devices. The content is strategically organized in three unique sections to ensure that lawyers, students, and members of the public can quickly and effectively find what they need. We understand that new can sometimes feel confusing. For this reason, we intentionally designed the new website to feel familiar and welcoming to our longstanding users who may be accustomed to the previous dcbar.org site. Our goal was to enhance and streamline the user experience while remaining true to our trusted mission and values. Improving on the previous blog style site where visitors were faced with long paragraphs of text and non-categorized results, we've given the content a more intuitive organization using visual clues and graphic elements. We also identified the pages that are most frequently visited and made them accessible to our users with fewer clicks by either linking them directly or from the navigational bar. The new navigational toolbar has pulled down subcategories that will take you to your desired landing page with a consistent click-through experience. Our new search interface allows you to discover articles, documents, and news even faster, saving time and improving results. The search results can be narrowed further by choosing the website itself, Washington Lawyer, News, or the Pro Bono Center pages as the source of the information. The updated frequently asked questions are categorized and searchable and address your most relevant concerns. If you require further assistance, our contact page is designed to connect you easily with the right DC Bar staff member who will be able to address your questions. A priority of the new DC Bar strategic plan is to enhance member value by prioritizing ease of user experience and improving online and remote access to DC Bar programs and services. Especially now, when we are primarily engaging with our members online, this new website helps the Bar meet that important goal. Please visit the DC Bar's new website at dcbar.org. In 1884, Ida B. Wells bought a first-class train ticket from Memphis to Nashville. However, once underway, the train crew ordered her to move to the car for African Americans. She refused on principle. After being forced from the train, she sued the railroad, winning a $500 settlement. But the decision was later overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court. This injustice led to a life of social and political activism. As a journalist and later a newspaper owner, Ida courageously fought against sexism, racism, and violence. In 1909, she co-founded the NAACP. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Thank you for that uplifting message about Ida B. Wells. We need to keep telling these stories so that future generations can learn from and be inspired by powerful women. Our next speaker is Chief Judge Beryl Howell of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. 
She joined the court in 2010 and became chief judge in 2016. In addition to her duties on the bench, Chief Judge Howell has spent time in the classroom teaching legal ethics at American University's Washington College of Law. Today, she's here to talk about trailblazer judge Bernita Shelton Matthews, the first woman to serve as a federal trial judge. Please welcome Chief Judge Beryl Howell. Hello, everyone. I am Chief Judge Beryl Howell of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. Thank you to the DC Bar for the invitation to join you today, albeit remotely, to talk about one of my personal heroes, Judge Bernita Shelton Matthews, who paved the way as the first woman appointed to serve on my court, and indeed the first woman appointed to serve as a federal district court judge anywhere in the country. While the first woman to be appointed to an Article III court was Florence Allen, who was appointed to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in 1934, 15 long years passed before another woman was appointed to an Article III court. That woman was Judge Matthews, who was appointed to my court in 1949 by President Truman. She served for 27 years as a judge on my court, nearly 18 years as an active judge, and another decade as a senior judge until she retired in 1977. Judge Matthews' life and career has particular resonance today as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote, not only because she was a fervent and avid suffragette, but also because her work for women's equality did not stop there. She went on to help draft the Equal Rights Amendment and serve as an important mentor of and advocate for women her entire career. With Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's recent passing and our remembrances of her legendary accomplishments on behalf of women, it feels right to highlight another pioneering jurist of an even earlier generation, someone whom Justice Ginsburg herself admired. Although Judge Matthews was well known in her day and even mentioned as a possible Supreme Court nominee, she is less so today. And I welcome the opportunity to talk about her and her impact on the law and society. Bernita Shelton was born in Mississippi and was the only daughter with four brothers. Her mother died when she was 16, leaving her to help care for the family, while her elder brother went off to college and law school. This is what Bernita wanted to do too, but her father had other ideas. He wanted her to be a music teacher but the mistake Bernita's father made was allowing Bernita to tag along to the local courthouse where he was the elected clerk of the Chancery Court. She was introduced to the law there, sparking her interest in a legal career. She did earn a teaching certificate at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, but her wish to become a lawyer remained. Matthews met her future husband, Percy, while in high school. They were married in 1917, right when World War I began, and Percy immediately enlisted and left for the war, not to return for several years. While her husband was away in World War I, Matthews supported herself teaching piano, but then set her sights on her own personal goal. She saw advertisements for federal agencies in Washington, D.C., looking for clerks, and she seized the opportunity. She took a job as a clerk at the Veterans Administration and also enrolled in night school, in law school at night at the National University, which we know today as George Washington University. While in law school, Matthews became involved in the suffrage movement when she was recruited by a fellow law student, an older woman named Julia Jennings, who was also an outspoken activist. Matthews agreed to help the National Women's Party and joined the fight for the women's right to vote. She began to picket the White House in support of the suffrage movement, usually on Sundays because between her day job and night classes at law school, that's when she had free time. The women picketing were harassed, both by law enforcement and by male onlookers. She recalled being asked when she was carrying a banner, what are you being paid for this? and having men try to wrench her banner away. She was also present in 1919 when a suffragette 
burned a figure of the president, resulting in a number of picketers being arrested. Matthews used her wits to avoid arrest, however, explaining in her, her oral history, at that time, if someone came up to you and asked you a question and you undertook to expound on the suffrage movement, then you were arrested. So when anybody tried to get me to talk with them, I didn't talk. I didn't answer because I was a law student. And I thought that if I got arrested and had an arrest record, it would be counted against me when I tried to get admitted to the bar. So I didn't speak at these rallies. One of my current colleagues, Royce Lamberth, heard some of Judge Matthews' stories directly from her when he was an assistant U.S. attorney and she was on the bench here. According to him, Judge Matthews complained that the park police would arrest a suffragette for picketing without a license if she so much as responded to a question asking for her name. Bernita just kept her lips sealed. Suffragettes marching and picketing were not too popular in law school either. Many male students had just returned from the war. About her fellow male law students, Judge Matthews said, they didn't think that the women who are putting on this great campaign and bothering the president were very patriotic. Nevertheless, Matthews apparently got along well enough with her classmates to be elected vice president of her law school class. She received her law degree in 1920, the same year she passed the bar and the 19th Amendment became part of the U.S. Constitution. What a heady time for women's rights. But Judge Matthews and her fellow members of the National Women's Party viewed gaining the vote as only one step in acquiring equal rights for women. They next turned their attention to continue to work to improve the status of women and passage of an Equal Rights Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. One of her early projects, in conjunction with the National Women's Party, was to research laws that discriminated against women and to draft bills to fix them. As it turned out, Matthews didn't have to look far for such discriminations. At that time, DC Bar Association was not admitting women, even though the women passed the bar. Matthews applied for admission along with three other women, but her check was returned along with the others. The DC Bar Association claimed that the women's sponsors had withdrawn support, but even the male sponsors protested that wasn't true. So Matthews and the other women who had passed the bar simply formed their own professional associations, including the Women's Bar Association of the District of Columbia and the National Association of Women Lawyers. Matthews oversaw the legal research team at the National Women's Party for a number of years, working to identify and redress discriminatory laws at both the federal level and in the states. Among other things, she worked on legislation to ensure the right of women to serve on juries. She drafted a bill, ultimately passed, to change a law in DC barring women from serving on juries to ensure that women would be able to serve. And at the federal level, she testified before the House Judiciary Committee about the same issue, and ultimately a federal law allowing women to serve on juries was passed. She also secured a ruling from the US State Department that a woman who has not changed her name upon marriage need not assume her husband's name to obtain a passport. In addition to identifying and working to change gender discriminatory laws, Matthews was involved in the ultimately unsuccessful efforts to secure passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, testifying before Congress on multiple occasions. With her law degree in hand, Matthews had set up a small office with a couple other women, lawyers, near the courthouse and focused on real estate. This really came in handy in one of her big cases before she became a judge, a case that pitted Judge Matthews against a former president and the then Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Chief Justice Taft, in a fight over the land upon which the Supreme Court sits today. 
Taft became Chief Justice in 1921 and immediately started a campaign to move the Supreme Court out of the U.S. Capitol, where it had been meeting since 1801, into its own building. He had his sights on a building just across First Street that was called the Old Capitol, so named apparently because the, when the British burned the Capitol in the White House during the War of 1812, the building had been erected as temporary headquarters for Congress. In 1927, the government started condemnation proceedings to take the land to use it for a new building for the Supreme Court. But the National Women's Party owned the building and the land. Bernita Matthews represented the Women's Party at a trial over the value of the land. The government tried to claim that the land and building had no historical value, and thus the condemnation value should be low. But Matthews called powerful experts and won the case, securing the then largest settlement in history against the government in the condemnation proceeding, $300,000. Over almost 20 years in private practice, including in her own law firm, Matthews, Berrien, and Great House, Matthews became well-known in Washington. She taught at the National Law School, now GW, and served as president of both the National Association of Women Lawyers and the Women's Bar Association of the District of Columbia. In 1949, President Truman appointed Matthews as a recess appointment to be the first district court judge in the country to serve on the federal district court here in DC. This made front page news. In her oral history, she, expects, she expressed surprise at the tremendous amount of publicity that her appointment received, but she shouldn't have been surprised. By this time, she was endorsed by the Bar Association of the District of Columbia and also had supporters among senators and congressmen who knew her from her legislative efforts and appearances on the Hill. Judge Matthews was the only woman on the district court until President Jimmy Carter appointed Joyce Hens Green in 1979 and Norma Holloway Johnson in 1980. That is a shocking nearly 30 years that she was the only woman on the court. It makes me feel so lucky when I look around me and have had seven women judges as colleagues on my own bench and enjoy having as fellow chief judges both Anna Blackburn Rigsby on the DC Court of Appeals and Anita Josie Herring on the DC Superior Court. How nice not to be a rare bird. That was not the case for Judge Matthews for her time on the bench. The reaction to her arrival on the district court was mixed. Apparently, some of her fellow judges agreed among themselves to assign her all the long motions, the most technical and least rewarding part of the court's docket. Another one of her new judicial colleagues was quoted as saying that he felt Quote, Mrs. Matthews would be a good judge, but that there was just one thing wrong. She's a woman. This judge, to his credit, later told her that he had been mistaken. Judge Matthews proved herself with her extraordinary work ethic. Some of the judges with whom she worked periodically tried to convince her that she was carrying more than her share of the load. She said she would never wanted it said that a woman could not keep up with the men. As a judge, she handled some notable cases, including presiding over the 1957 bribery trial of Jimmy Hoffa with various oh. attempted disruptions and an ultimate acquittal. She also upheld the right of Nation of Islam members to conduct religious services at the local prison. One thing she would not do when she became a judge was to speak publicly about passage of the ERA even though she was very sought after by news outlets and women's groups to do so. She believed it would be improper for her to use her prestige and power as a federal judge to urge passage of legislation, legislation she might be called upon to interpret. That turned out to be somewhat wishful thinking on her part. But her efforts to encourage and support women continued in other ways while she was on the bench. She persisted with her male colleagues to include women attorneys on court of committees. And part of her important legacy was her own law clerks. 
she only hired women as law clerks. She explained, the reason I always had women was because so often when a woman makes good at something, they always say that some man did it. So I just thought that it would be better to have women. I wanted to show my confidence in women, so I always chose women. She pressured the DC US attorney to hire women, and one of her law clerks, Sylvia Bacon, became the first woman hired as an AUSA in the US Attorney's Office here in DC. Sylvia Bacon went on to be appointed a judge on the DC Superior Court. Others of Judge Matthews' law clerks also had illustrious careers in the US Attorney's Office here in DC. Judge Matthews took senior status in 1968, but rather than slow down, she accepted sittings on the Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, as well as on the US Court of Customs and Patents. Justice Ginsburg reflected on Judge Matthews in a speech she gave in 2004. She said the following, it was my great good fortune when I was appointed to the DC Circuit in 1980 to meet and converse with this truly brave human. Her eyesight was failing and she had difficulty hearing, but her spirit remained indomitable. She was one of those people who fit Mahatma Gandhi's description of what it takes to open doors, in her case, to a once silenced majority and to advance human rights. First, they ignore you, Gandhi said, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. That was high praise indeed. Today, Judge Matthew's portrait hangs in the front of the ceremonial courtroom of the E. Barrett Prettyman Courthouse, where she worked for so many years. This is a fitting tribute to a trailblazing woman who paved the way, not just for us women judges, but for all of us women lawyers. Please enjoy the rest of the conference, and thanks again for having me. Hello, I'm Nefer McDonald, the Affinity Programs Manager at Clio, cloud-based legal technology. We're a proud DC Bar member benefit, which entitles you to 10% off Clio products. Visit us at clio.com forward slash DC Bar to learn more. I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker. Doris Kearns Goodwin is a world-renowned presidential historian, Pulitzer Prize winner, New York Times number one best-selling author, sought-after international keynote speaker, and a partner at the film and television company Pastimes Productions. She's a highly regarded biographer of great leaders, writing about their complexities and the qualities that make them both noteworthy and legendary. Joining her in a fireside conversation is our very own Susie Hoffman a partner at Kroll and & Mooring and immediate past president of the DC Bar. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Susie Hoffman and Doris Kearns Goodwin to the program. Doris, we are delighted to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you for coming to share insights and inspiration on the history of the 19th Amendment and on voting rights. Now let's get started. Our country today seems to be in such turmoil we really have a triple crisis of the coronavirus, the economy, and the fight for racial justice. How does today compare to other tough times in our history? I think what's so daunting about today is that we don't know the end of the story. One of the things about history is when we look back at even tougher times, the Civil War, we know that it finally ended with the Union restored and emancipation guaranteed. We know that World War II, which was really tough in those early years, ended with an allied victory. But I think I'd like to go back to a time because there's a way of telling the story of how the people felt during that period to what it was like during the paralysis of those early years of the Great Depression. Can you imagine the widespread anxiety that people must have felt? In the spring of 1933, when FDR was about to be inaugurated, he was afraid the whole house of cards might collapse before he even had the chance to be inaugurated. 25% of the people were unemployed. Most people were working fewer hours than they were supposed to. People had lost their homes and their farms. Starving people were roaming the streets. And there was a sense of panic because you couldn't even get your money out of the banking system, which had collapsed. So there was this sense of how are we ever going to get through this? And what history can tell us is FDR came in. When he was inaugurated, he immediately understood the reality of the moment. He said only a foolish optimist would deny the brutal reality but the only thing to fear is fear itself. But most importantly, 
he promised action. He said he'd been given the gift of leadership by his election, and he promised that he would call Congress into an emergency session, and he would ask for a series of recommendations to put people to work, to end the crisis in that way, to at least take action. And if they didn't give it to him, he was going to ask for executive powers as if we were at a war. And so he called Congress into session. They solved the banking crisis in like two days. They got together. And then he put people to work in jobs. He got infrastructure going. He had social security and a safety net. And he carried people through until the war allowed the full economy to emerge. And it was extraordinary because just that leadership, this is what leadership can do. Um, headlines in the newspaper suddenly, we have a leader, everything will be all right. There was a letter from somebody who wrote to him and said, my roof fell off, my wife is mad at me, I've lost my job, our dog ran away, but everything's fine because you are there. So it just tells us that sometimes when the right leadership can combine in a time of crisis, that it can make a swift, it's going to take a while to heal this no matter what happens, but I, I still have trust that history shows us somehow we've emerged stronger from these other crises before and we can do so again. Well, that's, that's encouraging uh, for, for me and I think for all of us. Well, let's travel back a little farther to 1920 and the passage of the 19th Amendment when women won the precious right to vote that had before only been given to white men. Today, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of its passage, what kind of leadership did the suffragists employ to achieve their goals? Um, how do they leverage their political clout? Well, I think it all begins in a certain sense with the mission statement that was provided at Seneca Falls at that original meeting, the birthplace of the women's suffrage movement, when people got together and they provided a declaration of sentiments modeled on the Declaration of Independence, arguing for a whole range of, of, of women's rights, but the landmark right being asked for was the right to vote. And then you had a long period of time when there was simply organizing and speaking and lecturing, divisions within the movement. But I think the first big leadership event was the great parade that took place in 1913. There was such a sense of timing involved in the decision to put the parade the day before the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson, who was an opponent of women's suffrage. And the parade was spectacular. 8,000 people, um, horses, you know, bands, um, it, it just, it was an, ex, an ex spectacular event that they were able to organize. And then what happened that made it even more spectacular in a negative way, but gave them public sentiment, well, the men came. So <laughs> the men were all around because of the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson. And they started shoving and pushing the women. It's still impossible to remember, right? There's no police that stopped them from doing it. People were hurt. A hundred people were hospitalized. But the stories that followed that event raised consciousness. I mean, that's what happens. It's the same thing that happened in Selma, Alabama. And Lincoln said that when public sentiment is changed, anything is possible. And consciousness was roused about the suffrage movement. And then they took even more militant leadership actions um, when they picketed the White House because of Woodrow Wilson's opposition, day after day of picketing. And then finally, they were arrested, many of the women leaders, um, because of obstructing traffic. They were thrown into jail, and in jail, they went on a hunger strike, and they were force-fed. And the pictures that came from that and the stories that were released from that just, again, raised consciousness even more and anger and a realization that something fundamentally was unfair. And it only then increased the next possibility is that once Woodrow Wilson recognized what was happening, he had to begin to change his mind. He was shamed into beginning to do so. Yeah, that's it. Really, is an amazing, amazing story, and um, you know, it seems like one of the first times in history where there had been a parade or demonstration to to achieve an end. Um, how did the fact that women were working during World War One ultimately impact the success of the amendment? I think what really turned Woodrow Wilson, in addition to consciousness having been changed because of the parade and then the picketing events was the fact that women were working in, in thousands of jobs during World War I. They were ambulance drivers, they were working in manufacturing, they were working in agriculture. There were a group of women who were working on the front lines as telephone operators. And Wilson realized how unfair it was and what the image was, that they're working for the war effort and they're not even able to vote. So he finally went before a joint session of before the Congress and he argued that if women are our partners in war, then we need to be their partners in the vote. And that allowed the Congress, or it shaped the Congress to pass the amendment onto the states, 
for it ultimately get ratified. And finally, finally, um, women got the right to vote after all that long period of time. Right. I think 70 or 72 years it was uh, from when it was first um, initiated until it was finally passed. So it, it really was a lifetime plus. Um, was there anything that surprised you about the movement? I think what surprised me was exactly what you said, that it took so bloody long to happen. And also, I guess, when you read the early days when the women were beginning to organize of how many women were against the right to vote, this whole argument that they needed to spend time with their family and if they had to educate themselves in order to learn enough about the voting to be able to vote right, as if the men were all educating themselves. Um, it's, it's, still, it's still hard to imagine that, that it took that long and that there were such divisions even within the women themselves. It's such a fundamental right in a democracy. Right, I think that's one of the things that first surprised me when I started to read the history was that there was this group of women, the antis, who were actually against um, the passage of the 19th Amendment. So I, I think that was a real eye opener uh, for me. So I share that astonishment with you. Um, I've heard you say that the next major step for the women's movement took place during World War II. Um, can you tell us about that? I mean, there's no question in my mind that the numbers of women who came to work during World War II and the pride they felt in the work that they were doing and the sense of independence and the sense of camaraderie in some ways made them the mothers of the women's liberation movement that would later develop. I mean, just think about it. When they first started bringing women into the war effort, Eleanor Roosevelt had been for it from the very beginning, but the factory owners argued, oh, the women will never learn how to operate these complicated made machines, we can't have a social revolution in the middle of the war, um, and they'll destroy, distract the men on the assembly line, productivity will go down. But finally, by 1943, 60% of the jobs in the shipyards and the airplane factories were held by women. And the great thing was that productivity went way up rather than down. So that there was a study that was on how had these women learn to operate these complex machines. And I love the answer on one of the study forms. It said, oh, it was very simple. When a woman, unlike a man, was asked to operate a new piece of machinery, she would ask directions. <laughs> Obviously, it was more complicated than that. But when you think of the effort that women did during World War II, they set up daycare centers in the businesses so that they wouldn't have to shop and cook when they went home. They were even provided with hot meals besides the education of their children. The daycare centers were brought to a close as the women was coming to, as the war was coming to an end. But even though manufacturing jobs were then not allowed for women so that the returning veterans could have them, they kept staying in the workforce. And I think learning that value of work, learning what they were valued as, it did produce some tensions at home, but I think it created that upward rise of women working that is absolutely fundamental to all the women's rights since then. Yeah, indeed, and, and, and the battle continues, I think, for, for women's rights. Um, how did and the, the battle still continues. <laughs> right, indeed, to this day, um, and in our current elections. Um, how did the lessons of the suffrage movement and what followed uh, impact the next major voting rights initiative uh, the one that you've written a lot about, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Well, when you think of it, first of all, it's finally, finally the time when black women get the right to vote because they hadn't been included in that earlier amendment. But what happens is the Selma demonstrations that were taking place remind me in some ways of the importance of the parade and the importance of the picketing event because what happened is when the marchers in Selma, Alabama, including John Lewis, were peacefully marching from Selma to Montgomery and were met by a brutal attack from the Alabama state troopers, that image was cast in television all across the nation. Mm -hmm. And just like what happened with the parade and the picketing events, it changed the consciousness of the people and public sentiment was changed. And at that moment, luckily, this is when real change takes place, when there's an outside movement that can change public sentiment. And then there's levers of power inside that can translate that into an actual action. And the lever of power there happened to be Lyndon Johnson. And what had happened is he had already been able to help with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Again, the Civil Rights Movement had made that possible in 1964, ending legal segregation in the South. And he wasn't planning on having voting rights in 1965 because he knew the country had to absorb civil rights. He had Medicare and Medicaid and aid to education and NPR and PBS and immigration reform all on the agenda. But he understood the timing had made this necessary and he wanted to have it happen. 
So he decided to make a speech to a joint session of Congress calling for voting rights. And it's very personal to me because my husband, Richard Goodwin, who died a couple of years ago, I lived with him for 42, 45 years, was the policymaker and the speech, speech writer who wrote the speech, which is one of the best speeches that I think LBJ or, or many leaders ever made. He goes before a joint session of Congress, and it could have been the same thing we said about what happened in Minneapolis and George Floyd. He said, every now and then history and fate meet at a certain time in a certain place. So it was in Lexington and Concord. So it was at Appomattox. So it was in Selma, Alabama. And then he went on to say, this is not a Negro problem, not a white problem, not a Northern problem, not a Southern problem. It is an American problem. And we are met here to meet that problem. And then he said, and if we work together, we shall overcome, which means the leader of the White House is combining with the anthem of the civil rights movement. And that's when change becomes inevitable. Weeks later, the Voting Rights Act passed. So those are the moments I think that we look for in our history when the outside movement meets the levers of power inside and when real, real change can take place. Yeah, um, it, it's an amazing story um, and it's reality. And I have to say, I, um, I did read your book, Leadership in Tumultuous Times, and you referenced that speech and it, it's very moving. Um, you know, even, even today, it, it, it resonates. I think we can make analogies with some of the things that we're experiencing right now. So, um, and you know, if I could just say something more about it, I mean, the interesting thing is that Johnson decided on a Sunday night to give the speech on Monday night. So my husband had only that day of Monday to write that speech. And Johnson knew enough not to bother him because he knew what enormous pressure he was under. But at one point he called him and he said, could you add something in the speech about Catula? And Dick knew what that meant. Johnson had been a teacher in Catula when in between college he had to make some money. And there were elementary school kids who were Mexican-Americans, and he saw the pain of prejudice on their face. And he, he said, I want to say something about that. And what he said in the speech was, when I was there in 1928 teaching these kids, I never thought I'd be in a position to do something for their children and their grandchildren, but I have that power now, and I mean to use it. And that was an incredible moment in the speech, that use of power to make something happen. That's when speeches matter, when they produce action. It's not just the words, it's the action they produce. Right, right, and, and I think the story also, um, I think that was the thing that came home to me was that Lyndon Johnson was relaying something of his you know, personal life and, and something that had an impact on him. So it wasn't some just lofty ideals. It was like, you know, this really impacted me and this is the origin of my passion for it. So. Um, Right, so I, I just thought that was was phenomenal. Um, and back to suffrage, um, what are those lessons of the suffrage movement that are echoing today? Um, we have assaults on the legitimacy of the voting process and, and warnings about fraudulent voting. Um, since voting is the centerpiece of democracy, what are the implications of these attacks and, and, and how can we address them in a way to preserve our democratic process? I mean, I think especially when we think about what people went through and what they gave up and what they had to fight for to get that right to vote, you know, for women eventually, for, for black people, it's just an extraordinary thing that we cannot let our guard now to, down now to, um, to, to not protect that right to vote. It is the power in a democracy, the right to vote. And somehow we're gonna to have to fight back about what we're hearing about suppression taking place in various states. It already has in some of the primaries that we saw before. The Michigan people are actually, actually the attorney general there is trying to figure out a way to actually arrest people who do suppress the vote. And I think maybe other states are gonna to have to figure out what to do with that. We're gonna to have to figure out how voting by mail cannot be something that is looked down upon. We've done it for years. There, it is absolutely a protected thing. There's no real evidence that there's been any fraudulence with it. Otherwise, people are going to have to be able to risk their lives as they did when they went in the primaries in Wisconsin, knowing that the virus was at stake, but to vote in person. Um, this is, this is a, as important election as we've had in our lifetime. And the most important thing about it is that the right to vote has got to be expressed. And it still seems to me a shocking thing that it is not something that everyone in the country wants to protect. I, I think we should have a national voting day or a voting week or something. It should be made as easy as possible for people to express 
who they want to vote for, because that is the fundamental right of a democracy. But I think the good thing about the 100th anniversary being celebrated is just to remind us, and it reminds us in analogy of the civil rights movement as well, of what people went through. And if we can't protect that right now, then, then, then we're not doing our, our, guilt, our responsibility as American citizens. Right. And do you think the focus on the 19th Amendment and, and also the, the media reports about, um, about potential fraud, do you think that's raising awareness? Do you think it'll actually in, lead to an increase in our voter turnout um, you know, for the first time in a while? I, I do think so. I mean, again, when you look at the percentage of turnouts in previous elections, it's just an astonishing thing that you don't have 90% turnout. You know, some years ago, I was part of a delegation of Americans that went over to look at the first Czechoslovakian de democracy election in some years. And mothers were bringing their kids to the voting box to just show them what it was like to put a piece of paper in a box that had a, a, a a, a line in it that you just stuck your ballot in. And it just reminded you of how much this right matters. And I do think that these anniversaries are really important because they remind us of times in history which are part of the progress as well as the sadness that we've not reached the ideal of where we should be. But I think it can motivate action when we see that. So I think it's a great thing that we're talking about the 19th Amendment right now. We should, I, I didn't know as much about it as I should have known until we've just had this whole huge discussion. I know a lot of other people at um, this day will have been able to talk a lot more about it, but it's about time that our curriculum really puts it more into the front and center than it has been in the past. Well, I have to say, I've, I've learned a lot during the past year um, as we've had various programs that have focused on the 19th Amendment. And um, I, I have been really amazed um, at the fervor and the passion of, of, of the women that were involved. Um, you've often noted that an engaged and educated electorate is a vital part of leadership. Um, as I mentioned, through reading some of the history of the 19th Amendment's passage, I've come to appreciate how hard fought this victory was and how much these women sacrificed to win the right to vote for me and for other women. Um, it really makes me cherish this right and make sure that I and my fellow citizen, citizens exercise it. Um, and how can we ensure that the story of this long fought battle for voting rights for women um, and for people of color continues to be told? I think one of the hopeful things that we're seeing in, in schools right now is a change in the curriculum over the last decades or so. You know, it used to be that history would be taught from the top down. So it would be sort of the way I've studied history in the past. You'd be reading about the presidents. But every important change for social justice that's taken place in the country has come from the ground up. And I think we're seeing that now. They're talk talking more about the anti-slavery movement. We're talking more about the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement. The more that's studied in schools, the more you're gonna get more teachers, more professors for whom that's their field. So you're hiring new PhDs, you're doing new kinds of research projects, new kinds of history that's showing from the ground up. You know, when Lincoln was called a liberator, he said, don't call me that. It was the anti-slavery movement that did it all. When you think about the progressive movement, that Teddy Roosevelt was able to capitalize. And it was there in the cities and states, the settlement house movement, the, the, the social gospel movement before he was able to do what he did. The civil rights movement was obviously essential for Lyndon Johnson. And all the changes that we've had have come from movements. So I think curriculum is shifting in schools. And I think we have to be able to do that more and more. So people understand the importance of power in the people to make things happen, not just in the people who are there. And then I think the other way to ensure that this right is guaranteed is to have more women elected to office. I mean, one of the exciting things about the 2018 midterm elections was so many women who ran for office for the first time, who came from different fields, who won office. I mean, that's the key in a certain sense to have people in the levers of power. And I think women are beginning to exert their power in all manner of businesses and organizations and law schools. It's a great time to be a woman. I sometimes wish I were a young woman again, starting all over again, because I think, I think the path is there for women to have a much greater say in our democracy. And obviously the right to vote is an essential part of that. Well, well, that's good to hear. I have two young adult daughters, so um, I am, I'm looking for, forward to them, you know, seizing that opportunity themselves. Um, and it seems from what you say that in, in, 
in telling that history in the schools and beyond, we're compelled to move that experiment that is our democracy forward. Um, what do you think are the forces in play today that in a way are causing our country to be so polarized? One of the things that Teddy Roosevelt warned about, I think is happening today. He warned that democracy might be at risk if people in different sections or classes or religions began to see each other as the other rather than as common American citizens. If there wasn't an understanding of the passions and prejudices and hopes of the other people in different parts of the country. And I think what we've seen happening in, in really for some time and it's been stoked in these last years and the divisions in the media make it even greater is that sense of people seeing each other as the other rather than as citizens. And it's, it's a polarization that's been seen in Washington but it's seen in the country as a whole that lack of collaboration, the lack of understanding, the lack of empathy, really. I mean, the important thing that we need is people to feel an understanding of what other people are feeling. And right now, that polarization is deep. I mean, we had, sometimes I go back and it's a scary thought to the 1850s, because in the 1850s, you had much like the media polarization today. If you wanted to get your news in the 1850s, you had to buy your partisan newspaper. So you'd be reading just the Republican newspaper, just the Democratic or the Whig newspaper. So suppose you're reading about a Lincoln-Douglas debate. You're going to be seeing and reading only if Lincoln is, is you're reading in the Republican newspaper. He's going to be so great in the debate. He was carried out on the arms of his supporters. You read it in the Democratic paper. He was so terrible that he fell on the floor and they had to drag him out. And that's the situation we're in today, where, where alternative senses of uni universe are in the different cable networks or in the different social media. And what had happened after the Civil War, finally national newspapers came into being. You had national radio. We had three television networks. There was at least an agreement on the facts, if not the opinions. And somehow we've got to figure out ways in which we can have an agreement on facts and then work together for different ways of dealing with those facts. But as long as truth is in judgment or in question, I think we've got a difficulty in this democracy. It, indeed, I have to say that I myself try to try to watch different networks um, and indeed the quote, the opposition network to, to try to um, get a balance and, and, and see, try to see through other eyes, um, you know, the news that I'm, I'm getting, but, but it's a challenge, I have to say, and um, I hope it's, it's helping. Um, although I don't think I've changed my mind much. Um, <laughs> no, but I think you're right. I think it's an important thing because what we need in leaders and what we need in human beings is that what, what empathy is, is an understanding of someone else's point of view. And at least if you can understand it and listen to it, then maybe you can begin to figure out a way to collaborate on it. But if you can't even do that, then there's no starting point. This is a bit of an aside, but um, as I began my year as bar president about a year ago, I met with a group called the Consortium of Legal Services Providers. They provide uh, primarily poverty law in the district. And I asked them as sort of my, my uh, parting you know, question, I said, what would you like me to share or um, to, to do during my year as bar leader? And one of the individuals said, I hope that you would encourage our lawyers to have more empathy. And um, at the time I thought it was a, a little bit of a strange response, but over the year and as I've reflected and, and heard individuals like you talk about the importance of empathy and seeing things from the other side, I've, I've really come to appreciate that, that response and, and hope that all of our leaders have more empathy. Um, do you have other ideas about ways that we might help, help bring us to, together to overcome that polarization? I think if I could do one thing right now, it would be to have a much larger national service program. We've got Teach for America, we've got City Year, we've got AmeriCorps, but there's more applicants for all of those positions than we can possibly have. But what if we really did have a program when we could maybe reach that younger generation where they're coming out of high school before going to college and they take a year or two and the kid from the city goes to the kid from the country and vice versa. And they're working together on some sort of mission. I mean, one of the things that I think created bipartisanship in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s was that the overwhelming majority of the congressmen and senators had been in World War II or the Korean War. 
So they knew what it was like to have a common mission that crossed all sorts of lines. Um, my son, Joe Goodwin, joined the Army right after 9-11. He had just graduated from Harvard College in the, in the June of, of 2001. And he said he was a pl platoon leader in Baghdad, and he earned a Bronze Star, and then he went back to Afghanistan, that nothing would equal that sense of leading a platoon from kids with all different educational backgrounds, all different parts of the country, and they came together for the common goal. And maybe a national service program could be the immoral equivalent of that, bringing that next generation to just understand each other more and care about, there's so many service projects that could be done in this country that are needed to be done. Um, there's gotta be a way somehow to break the, the, the situation that we're in right now, and maybe it has to be in the young people we begin to break it. Yeah, that, would, that would at least be a healing device, I think. Yeah, I think that's a um, you know a very valued um, perception. Uh, my uh, my oldest daughter, um, who I think had a very privileged upbringing, uh, is in boot camp right now, and the letters that she sent me there already show an awareness of you know the different lives, and certainly um, you know she's there with other enlistees, and um, I think it's really been eye opening for her. And um, I think it's going to be a transformative experience. So I, I think there's um, an incredible amount of value um, in what you just said. Um, so I will wish her the best. Good for her. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a tough time, but um, she's tough. She'll get through it. Um, looking at the forces of today, do you see it as a glass half full or a glass half empty? And is the progress today like um, any progress that we've seen in history? I think it's really important to remember the progress we've seen. I think sometimes in this, these last months, we've gotten so upset really about how far we are from the ideals, especially with the renewed interest in racial justice, that it sometimes feels like we haven't come anywhere for all these centuries. And by remembering where we've come, you know, we have changed things. You can remember why they were changed, why that happened, and then we can hope that we'll move that next step forward. I mean, Ernest Hemingway once wrote that everyone is broken by life, but afterwards some people are stronger in the broken places. And our country feels broken right now. It's gonna take some time to heal, but we have to believe that having come through this crisis, we've seen now the inequities of the society. We've seen the numbers of people who are people of color, who've been hurt by it at much greater degrees, getting sick, not having the hospitalization, not having the access to the same medicines that other people have. We've seen the numbers of them that are essential workers that have been on the front lines. And we have to have felt something about, we should have been coming through this crisis together as a nation. It might've been one of those moments as the war was, as, as certain common challenges have been that brought us together but maybe we're still in the middle of this. We still have time for that to happen, that we'll realize that the only way we're gonna get through the virus is by a collective identity and working on it together. The only way we're gonna recover the economy is have it be an economy that's, that's fair to all. And those things have been so laid bare during this that maybe that's the consciousness that needed to be roused for the next level of what we do once we get a vaccine and we get back, we create an economy that's fairer for more, more and the inequities are beginning to be healed. Well, I, I agree with you. I'm always somebody that's looking for a silver lining. So I hope the silver lining in this is that it's forced us to, to look at some of the, the problems more closely in America and, and address them with uh, a new fervor um, and, and, and make some, some more progress. So, And I think we just have to believe in the strength that the country has had in the past. You know, in the, in, in the last days before my husband died, um, a couple of years ago, he was working on a book about his experience in the 1960s, which was a decade which was filled with such promise and then ended in such darkness in many ways. Um, but it's important to remember, he remembered those moments of progress. And he talked about it the whole cycle of his life because he was older than me. He'd grown up in the depression. His father had lost his job. And then he was in those early days of world where he was 10 when Pearl Harbor happened. And he saw what it was like in those early days before we weren't sure at all that we had the strength to beat Hitler. He was with John Kennedy in the White House. He was in the White House the night that John Kennedy's body was brought back. He was there in the great days of LBJ, but then he left for the anti-war movement and he joined Robert Kennedy's campaign. He was with Robert Kennedy when he died. He saw the whole violence that occurred after Martin Luther King's death. 
and it seemed like everything was dark. But he said, in the end of this, he said, don't forget, America is not as fragile as we think. We've come through that time. We will come through this time. And I'd like to believe that I believe that as well as he did. I think history shows us that. That's the great thing about history. It's lessons, it's perspective, it's hope. Right, right. Well, I love those words. And, and someone once called me a determined optimist. So I'm going to grab onto those words and, and carry them with me, uh, you know, through these the coming months where, where I'm sure there'll be continuing to be uh, national challenges and personal challenges as well. Um, since we've been talking about the 19th Amendment, which is about women, um, I, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to ask a question um, about uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, with her passing, we lost a giant of the legal profession, um, a champion of women's rights, as well as civil rights and voting rights. Um, you know, in, in your estimation, what will be her historical significance? I think the most important thing is here was a woman for whom doors were closed when she was young, and she spent the rest of her life trying to open doors for other women. In fact, when my husband's archive, we were going through it in those last years before he died, he'd saved everything. And I found when I was going through it, a picture of his being, he was the president of the Harvard Law Review. And there's all these guys standing together and there's two women on the side of the picture. One of them is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So oh, she wow. was on the law review the same. Isn't that amazing? There's, there's her picture. So I brought it into him and I said, oh my God, look at this. <laughs> and it turned out as we know now from the whole story of, of Ruth. So when my husband is a third year student and he's looking for a job, they're romancing him all over the country. He was first in his class. He was the editor of the law review and he gets a job with Justice Frankfurt and he could have gone to any law firm he wanted as all those other guys could. And as we now know, she couldn't even get a single law firm in New York to hire her. And somebody suggested her to Justice Frankfurt. He said, well, I haven't ever had a woman before and he wouldn't even interview her. It made me so angry. But then on the other hand, the other side of it was, look what she did. Instead of being bitter about that, she just dedicated her life case by case, systematically to open doors for other women. And I think that it was an extraordinary thing how her death touched people. You know, it reminded me because people were hugging, people went to the Supreme Court. When FDR died, people said they felt they had lost a friend, not just simply a leader. And I think they felt that with Ruth. The young women felt she had, she had created a pathway for them that might not have been there. They know enough about what she created for the people before. I think just like the history of the 19th Amendment allows us to see what those women went through, her history allows us to see what women, an individual woman went through and how she was determinedly optimistic too at the end. She was saying progress will still be made. And I think it's a great lesson for us all. Right, well, I think those are, are wonderful words to, to close on. Um, she was an inspiration. A, a lot of our audience today is women lawyers. So, and many of us idolize her. And um, I've always been sort of surprised at what a culture, <coughs> cultural icon she's come, become for young women. Um, and I feel like I lost a friend because we had opera tickets on the same night. So I would wave to her. Oh, friend. wow. <laughs> she was, um, and you probably have heard this story, but when she would come into the hall, it would be at the very last minute before the performance would begin. She would come into um, Secret Service and her entourage. Um, I was up in the second balcony. She was down in orchestra. And as she came in, the entire audience would stand up and give her an ovation. And she would turn and she would do a little wave to us in the second balcony. So, um, oh. so <laughs> it, it was, um, again, something so very personal, um, but really reflected another, another side of her, um, which was very endearing um, in its own way. So. So, um, so thank you for your comments about her there. She's, she is very special to all of us. And I also want to thank you uh, for this reflective and inspiring conversation. As you do so often, you brought history, in this case, the history of the 19th Amendment, alive and given it meaning. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, I'm so glad I could be with you. Absolutely. What fun to do this. Great. Thank you. What a wonderful day this has been. Thank you so much to Judge Howell for her fascinating lecture and to Doris and Susie for the illuminating dialogue. 
and a special thanks to Cleo for bringing our keynote address. We would be remiss to end the day without mentioning the passing of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. As an attorney, she worked with grand resolve to advance the rights of women. As a judge, she worked to uphold the rights and protections of all. Her death is an immense loss for this country, but we will continue to honor and benefit from her legacy for decades to come. As a reminder, after the short lunch break, please stay tuned for our afternoon breakout sessions where we will continue to share engaging information and ideas. Details are listed in the schedule on the left hand of your screen. We look forward to you joining us again tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m., for timely hot topics in voting rights and other highlights. See you then, and stay safe.